Okay, we're ready, everybody. How's it going? Your Ben Jarofsky show for Tuesday, October 1st is just moments away. But before we get into that, we need to thank the following unions for jumping on board and sponsoring our program. First up, it's the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, and the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. Thank you to those unions. You guys are awesome. We appreciate you sponsoring the show. And, of course, today's show is brought to you by our good friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. The Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. It is Tuesday, October 1st, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, this is The Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, our Chicago Reader colleague, Maya Duke Masov is back. We welcome Amisha Patel, our favorite grassroots organizer. And it's the 35th Ward Alderman himself, Carlos Ramirez Rosa. And now your host, Chicago Reader columnist, Ben Jarofsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Mama Lavrov Tuesday. And here's why. Great weekend. Do you have a good weekend? Yes, three days ago. <laughs> it was awesome. I had a great weekend, man. I was uh, reading tons of stories about my beloved Bulls. Their season's about to open. It was media day, but Dennis doesn't allow me to talk about sports. So even though I want to talk about the Bulls, I'm going <laughs> to... Can't talk about them because I'm being officially censored. Anyway. Thank you. <laughs> listen to a ton of Stevie Wonder songs. I love Stevie Wonder. For some reason, I was just really feeling Stevie Wonder. Spent a lot of time this weekend listening to Stevie Wonder. Wish, wish I was listening to him now because for some reason, I was listening to the oldie station as I was coming in today. And now in my head, I have a song called Indiana Wants Me, which is one of the worst songs of the 1970s. You ever hear that song? I've been hearing it ever since you walked in, and I agree. It's horrible. <laughs> Indiana Wants Me. And at the end, they play. Police uh, cars are they're coming in. The guy, the guy apparently killed someone who insulted his girlfriend. That's the premise of the song. And now the police are closing in. I need help from Indiana Wants Me, one of the worst songs ever. Anyway, spent also spent a lot of time this, read, uh, this weekend reading about our lunatic commander-in-chief. The man is out of his mind, ladies and gentlemen. Good God, the latest I hear is that he is uh, saying the whistleblower committed treason. He is tweeting out uh, tweets some, suggesting that there will be a bloody civil war should the Democrats impeach him. Nobody's going to fight a civil war over you, dude. They may buy your MAGA hats, but no one's going to fight a civil war over you. The dude is out of his mind. Oh, we're bringing on Jimmy Coogan later on this week, our uh, esteemed attorney and advisor. He's going to be talking about all things uh, whistleblower gate and interesting uh, uh, stuff on Attorney General Barr. Love to have Coogan in the studio. We'll be having him on. Uh, just cut that deal, D. He'll be here later in the week. But anyway, there was this one interesting item that I uh, saw in the newspaper. It hasn't got a lot of talk or attention. I found it fascinating from an ir ironic standpoint. And uh, this is uh, too rich to believe, D. Uh, okay, so the conversation with the Ukrainian president is not is not the only transcript that congressional Democrats are interested in uh, subpoenaing. They also want to get access to President Trump's conversations with Putin, or as Monroe likes to call him, Putin. <laughs> That's my Monroe imitation. Anyway. Uh, they want to get access to those transcripts, and I, for one, cannot wait to read those. My attitude, by the way, is bring in the light, to quote Lori Lightfoot. You know, the Republicans are only interested in bringing in the light when they can shed light on the, the wheelings and dealings of Democrats, and it's pretty much vice versa with Democrats. I'm an equal opportunity bring in the light. I want all the light in, so let's see the conversations with Putin. I'd love to see those transcripts. Anyway, it's interesting. The Russians objected when word broke that congressmen, uh, Democratic congressmen, were interested in getting the transcripts of Trump's conversations with Putin. The Russians objected. They said they were unhappy. Here's how they reacted. Sergei Lavrov, who's the Russian foreign minister, uh, when asked about it said, and I quote, <clears throat> My mom taught me that, that it was improper to read other people's letters. 
There are traditions that presume a certain level of confidentiality. One more time. My mom taught me that it was improper to read other people's letters. There are traditions that presume a certain level of confidentiality. That's Sergey Lavrov talking about the advice that his mom gave him. Oh, really? Well, Sergey, where's Mama Lavrov? When, uh, we need her now. Huh? <laughs> what does Ma- Mama Lavrov have to say about Putin's hackers breaking into Democratic computers and stealing their personal emails? Was she outraged about that? Huh? <laughs> where is she? We could use a little Mama Lavrov every now and then, right, D? Where are you, Mama? <laughs> you know where she is, D? Oh, hey! Under the table. Mama Lavrov! Under the table. She's under the table. I'll tell you what. Mama Lavrov's no fool. She, she may be upset that the Democrats want to see Putin's private conversations with Donald Trump, but she sure is not going to speak out about Putin hacking into Democratic computers and stealing their private conversations. D, she's under the table. Guess who she's with? All the Republicans. All the Republicans who are afraid of speaking about a lot of people under that yeah, table. Yeah, there right? is. Mama, Lav- Mama Lavrov is under the table with the co- congressional Republicans. Yes, indeed. I love that. that is rich. Sergey Lavrov. My mom taught me it was improper to read other people's letters. There are traditions that presume a certain level of confidentiality. Where was Mama Lavrov when Putin's hackers hacked into the Democratic computers, ladies and gentlemen? We got a great show today, everybody. Maya will be here. Yes, indeed. Our oh, Chicago my. Reader colleague, Maya Duke Masova. That one and only Maya will be here. I love it when Maya comes on Tuesdays. In addition to that, the great alderman from the 35th Ward, Carlos Ramirez Rosa, will be in the studio with Amisha Patel. That's a tag team of progressive politics in the city of Chicago, unlike any other. They'll be talking about all kinds of things, budgets, taxes, potential teacher strike. I know that'll be on the top of the list. Uh, Lincoln Yards update from uh, Amisha. We'll get that. And then I get to, Amisha will leave and Carlos and I will take the deep dive and all the political talk of the day, national political talk. Carlos said he's been following Whistleblower Gate. I'm sure he's got a lot of ideas on that. I believe Carlos is for 10 trivia points, D. Who is Carlos supporting for president? Bernie Sanders. Very good. Damn. Good God. We'll have to uh, talk a little national politics with Carlos as well. So plenty of political talk ahead of us before we do any of that. The young man from Alton with the news. Hey, everybody. How's it going? My name's Dennis. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Would it kill you to just say Dennis with the news? <laughs> and explain who I am every time. The young man this, from Alton. The pride of joy of Southwest High School. Huh? Southwestern. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Came close. All right, let's find out what's happening. Oh, we got to change my camera here. Let's find out what's happening in Illinois and Chicago this Tuesday afternoon. No public uh, events scheduled for the Illinois governor today. And for the record, I love puppies. (laughs) But he did make news on Monday, and apparently J.B. Pritzker also loves Lincoln. Ah. The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times and Tina Fondella's. It's been plagued with problems for years, but the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum is not hanging up its hat. I think it's a Lincoln hat joke there. Uh, Days after Governor J.B. Pritzker announced U.S. Transportation Secretary and former Republican Congressman Ray LaHood would be overseeing the board of the Springfield Lincoln Library and Museum, the governor on Monday announced the addition of six new Board members. Pritzker's office said by statute, the board must feature four public members and one expert uh, each in business, Lincoln's history, Illinois history, library and museum studies, historic preservation, cultural tourism, uh, conservation, digital uh, digitalization and technological innovation. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Way to go, J.B. Pritzker. Uh, because aside from creating a time travel committee to go back and stop that jerk John Wilkes booth, you've come up with the best way in 2019 <laughs> to save Abraham Lincoln. I'm yeah. not a perfect person. <laughs> oh, it should be noted also that uh, one of the names announced as a newly appointed member of the Lincoln Library Board was a gentleman by the name, a very familiar name, especially uh, after last week, a uh, gentleman by the name of Martin Sandoval. Mm-hmm. All right. But hey, it's not that Martin ah. Sandoval, everybody, the mm-hmm. senator whose offices were raided by the FBI last week. It's a different Martin Sandoval. Apparently, it's a popular name. Uh, This Martin Sandoval is an attorney and founding partner of Compass Associates. Our Illinois friends of the conservative uh, persuasion, like our folks at the McHenry County blog, 
Well, they've been running with uh, false information, <laughs> trying to attack the governor uh, for hiring Sandoval, but they're mixing up their Sandovals, guys. I know homework sucks, but you got to do it, McHen- <laughs> McHenry County blog. Yeah, it's tough sometimes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's a good story. By the way, uh, let's a uh, shout out to Tina Svandela's from the Sun Times, our beloved bright one. That was a, pr- a pretty entertaining story. It was in my newspaper. That was home delivered today, as always. Uh, and uh, the uh, one of the interesting little side uh, bits on the story. I don't know if you saw this, D. She takes the deep dive on whether the hat that's in the Lincoln Museum is actually a hat that was worn by Abraham Lincoln. I don't know if you saw this, but apparently this is a raging controversy. Uh, for years and years and years, we were led to believe that that hat was Lincoln's hat. In fact, I don't know if you know this, D, but when there is a tie uh, in terms of redistricting uh, our legislative boundaries in the state of Illinois, what they do is they put, if the Democrats and Republicans can't agree on a, a legislative map, they put uh, names in a hat, Lincoln's hat, the Lincoln's hat, and they draw them, and whoever gets drawn gets to... Uh, rewrite the map. It's kind of a crazy way to do things. That's how we do it in the state of Illinois. I would say, thank goodness the Democrats control everything. Otherwise, there should be a chance that the Republicans uh, would draw the map. Anyway, putting that aside, the link, we always say, oh man, that's Lincoln's hat. So it's sort of like reaching back to our ancient roots. That's awesome. Yeah, except it may not be Lincoln's hat. Oh. They're doing all these forensic studies. They're studying like the dandruff, you know, dandruff in a hat. Like, could you, I didn't know Dandruff could survive. I mean, Lincoln was shot in 1865. You do the math. You're better at math than I am. That's a long time ago. That's like 150 years ago. Wait, or let, me, let, let me do it. Hold on. <laughs> Carry the one. Yeah. Yes, that is a long time that ago. That was a long time ago. I'll tell you what. He learned a lot of mathematics at Southwestern High, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, so it's like 150 years ago, but the Dandruff still exists, apparently, and they've studied the hat, and they've come to the conclusion that it's not Lincoln's hat. So maybe it's Marty Sandoval's hat. Did you ever think of that, D? It could be Martin, Marty Sandoval's hat, you know? The other Marty Sandoval. Or maybe it's Lincoln Park or something. Get it, D? Like, that's a rock. Reference. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Get it? Not Abraham Lincoln, but Lincoln Park? Yeah. Oh, okay. For so, 10 trivia points, name one Lincoln Park song. Uh, Indiana want me, Wants Me is their cover. It's a great song. Uh, Indiana Wants Arr! This is the police. Come on out. God, I wish I had been thinking of that song. Anyway. Catch him at the Lincoln Park concert. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I do not know a song by Lincoln Park. I just know that they spell it weird. It's L-I-N-K-I-N. Did you know that, D? Yes. <laughs> I saw that somewhere. I know that. Anyway, so it's very, I find that fascinating. It's not Lincoln's hat. They're doing the deep dive. Uh, And here's something. Emails released last week revealed that the state's top historian could find no evidence leaking the hat to Lincoln. Quote, it appears from my discussions with the state historian that he and his team have found no evidence confirming the hat belonged to President Lincoln. This does not mean that evidence does not exist, but the efforts of our team have been very thorough. Hmm. I hope they take that deep dive and find out whether it is Lincoln's hat. Oh, yeah. Lincoln's hat gate. <laughs> That's exactly. I'm going to ask uh, Alderman uh, Carlos Ramirez Rosa what does he think about Lincoln's hat gate? <laughs> All right. Get to the bottom of it. Yeah, it turns out it's just some guy named Bob Lincoln. It's his hat. Yeah. All right. Let's talk legislation. <laughs> After California did so, yeah. Illinois lawmakers are now racing each other to get legislation to Governor J.B. Pritzker to allow college athletes to be paid for their name, image, and likeness, something uh, the NCAA has long prohibited. In just five days, two bills have been uh, been filed in the Illinois House of Representatives that would do the same in Illinois. Ben, you said you wanted to talk about that. Yes, I do. I get to talk sports. Yes. Uh, How about those bulls? Huh? I love the, oh wait, I'm not supposed to talk about bull sports. Yes. No, I'm, this was a bill that was just signed by uh, Governor Gavin Newsom of California. I'm with him a hundred percent on this bill. Right now we have this really contradictory, hypocritical, uh, double standard where uh, coaches make gazillions of dollars coaching college teams and, and the athletes who play for them get nothing. They get a scholarship to the college. Thank you very much but i think uh when millions of dollars are at stake uh they should get cut in in the action too so what newsom and the the california legislators did they passed a bill that will enable uh athletes in california uh, college athletes in California to hire an agent, do shoe commercials, let's say, make some money uh, off of the fact that they're risking life and limb to play football, in this case, football uh, or basketball uh, for a college that uh, is making millions off of them and a coaches who are making millions off of them. And the funniest thing I saw was the coach 
of the, I think it's the University of Washington football team. I think his name is Mike Leash. Don't quote me on that. Oh, D. I won't. Some, some coach, I can't remember his name, but he was crying like a little baby. <laughs> and he was, you know why he said D? Not for any reason, you know, like he says, like, oh, well, our athletes should not, you know, should not be corrupted and amateurism should be pure because if, if Washington doesn't have such a law, it'll be harder to to recruit good football players out of California. Oh. He'll lose all the California football players because they're like, why should I go to Washington before we do a shoe commercial? Duh. So Leash is like, oh, my God, this is terrible. What Poor a guy. hypocrite, man. I'm all for it. Let's pa who, does it say by any chance who is sponsoring the bill here in Illinois? Any I don't have no? that information. Right, we'll get that person on the show. <laughs> no. Get down to it, all right? And Governor Pritz, uh, Pritzker signed into law a while back. He signed this one a while back, but it went into effect on uh, Sunday. Mm -hmm. Illinois companies can no longer ask job applicants or their previous employers about their pay history under a law that took effect Sunday. Supporters say the measure will help close the pay gap between women and men. Yeah, I'm, I'm for that as well. And uh, kudos to uh, Pritzker and the Democrats for passing that. That's the one, if you go for a job interview and they say, um, so how much did you make at your current job or your last job and let's say you only made i don't know i'm just making the numbers up uh ten dollars an hour and you say ten dollars an hour and they go we'll pay you 10 50 when maybe they were going to pay you 15 you get what i'm saying everybody so uh, yeah it's none of their business i'll pay you what they think you're worth so good job pritzker i'm uh, happy for the tribune i have to say did a uh, laid out a story today here you go everybody if you're interested with all the questions answer, asked and answered on this bill so good for pritzker all right moving on to the mayor of chicago this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Mayor Lori Lightfoot's Tuesday schedule includes a trip to City Hall to announce a $2.7 million investment in the city's 2020 census efforts in the morning. And, well, this seems to be her Tuesday ritual. No, not a luncheon. <laughs> she loves luncheons, everybody. It's a meeting with Chicago police top brass mm -hmm. and the last thing our the last thing our mayor wants to happen is in fact still on the verge of happening a chicago teacher strike we have some updates here when we left you on friday we learned that chicago teachers voted overwhelmingly in favor of authorizing a strike and that the earliest possible walkout date would be october 7th chicago teachers union president jesse sharkey said the 94 percent of the teachers had voted in favor of authorizing a strike and well, here's Sharky at a press conference on Thursday night. Tonight, members of the Chicago Teachers Union voted overwhelmingly to authorize a strike with 94% of our members voting yes. Is that you out there, Ben? <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> this is a clear signal from the members of the Chicago Teachers Union at 520 public schools across the city that we need the mayor and the Board of Education to address critical needs in our schools. And, you know, when you got audio of CTU Vice President Stacey Davis-Gates, you have to play it, all right? Here's her from the press conference as well. If the mayor has baked this into the budget, then it should be very easy then to put it in writing, right? It's already there. And so that's the dilemma that she has before her. Our members have spoken. The city of Chicago has spoken. Our fight is not a new fight. We have had the same line, the same demands, the same proposals for the last 10 years. The chickens have come home to roost. Put it in writing. Mic drop. <laughs> Stacey Davis Gates. She'll be here on Friday, D. She'll be here on Friday for a bonus interview. Uh, Stacey Davis Gates. We'll have a Chicago teacher, Andrea Parker, will be here as well today uh, for a bonus interview. Yeah, this is serious stuff. Uh, we're gearing up for a strike. As always, I always predict, you know, I'm, I'm the glass, uh, what are you calling me? Glass half full guy. I always predict they'll cut a deal. Remember in 2012, I predicted that the, the teachers. Yeah, just in this case, you're yeah. glass half full. <laughs> Most everything else, yeah. you're half empty. Yeah. yeah. By the way, how about those bears, huh? Please stop hey, talking oh, about sorry. sports. Uh, well, I was just going to do a half full thing the bears i'm gonna half stop you right now all right anyway but uh i just wrote about this, this is fresh in my mind i wrote about this for th this week's column in the reader which probably won't come out until tomorrow so i'll scoop myself here uh the issue the contentious issue in this showdown has to do with what we call wraparound employees and that's nurses psychologists social workers librarians uh these are people who are not in a classroom specifically but work with the teachers work with the students uh and uh chicago has a critical shortage 
shortage of these employees. It's been getting worse over the years. We've talked about it at some length many times uh, on the show. And what the teachers union is trying to do, this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to uh, get the Board of Education, uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot's handpicked Board of Education, um, if, so effectively they're trying to get Mayor Lori Lightfoot to do it, uh, to agree to put in the teacher's contract, in the contract that they're negotiating right now, a commitment to have a certain number of these wraparound employees at every single school. I don't know exactly what the language would be, but uh, one way or another would be like a cert for every, like say 200 kids, there has to be a nurse for every school has to have a librarian, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, that, that would force Lori Lightfoot to expend money on hiring new employees. And it's very obvious that Lori Lightfoot does not want to make that commitment, that commitment in writing, because here's the, here's the distinction folks. If it's just a verbal pr promise to put money in the budget, which is what she says, what Lori Lightfoot says she's going to do, then she's not obligated to keep that promise uh, should times get hard. She's not obligated to keep that promise even if we have a booming economy. She could just not put the job, not hire the people. And this is an old trick that uh, mayors and chief executives have. What they do is they uh, put some jobs in uh, the budget so that they draw the salary, but they don't fill them. And then effectively they can use the money for other things. It's a way they quote unquote balance their budgets. So what the union is saying, no, we want a contractual guarantee that you will hire a certain number of employees. And if you don't hire those employees, we can take you to arbitration. And it's pretty obvious that Lori Lightfoot does not want to make that commitment. And that's what this fight will ultimately come down to. And here's where the teachers union are in a little bit of a box D because because they are not allowed to strike. Uh, the, this crazy law that we have, the school reform law that was passed back in the 90s, limits their ability to strike over issues like wraparound employees or class size, et cetera. So you know Lori's gonna hold that over their head. It's gonna get, it could get real nasty before all is said and done, and there could be threats of uh, huge fines against the teachers union if they go out uh, on this issue, or, or there could be threats even of jailing some of the teacher union leaders. So this could get nasty. If some, like, isn't there any diplomat in the city of Chicago who could uh, get the teachers union and Lori Lightfoot in a room and just get him to come to terms on this. I personally believe, well, big surprise here, D, I'm pro teachers. Uh, I personally believe this language should be in the contract. I think the city of Chicago should make a commitment to hiring these wraparound employees and lowering class size. I absolutely believe it should be writing in the contract. We have provisions in all kinds of contracts protecting all kinds of needs, including, I just want to point out, the fiduciary needs of the developers at, Sterl, uh, at for Lincoln Yard. So if it's good for them, it should be good for the kids of Chicago. So that's my position. Ben Jarofsky is in favor for teachers a billion times over. <laughs> Yes, yeah. that's billion with a B. <laughs> All right, now. Yeah, which rhymes with P, which stands for pool, sorry. There went the millennials. All right, now to today's update. Chicago Public Schools and the Chicago Teachers Union have returned to the bargaining table today with a new offer from the city. The city's offer to the CTU includes hiring 200 more social workers and giving an immediate 14% salary hikes to nurses and other paraprofessionals who work in the school. And that's on top of the 16% salary hikes, beefed up health benefits for teachers and additional funding for teachers assistance to help for overcrowded classrooms but the ctu still says no dice yes. ctu president jesse sharky says the cps offer isn't enough in a statement to illinois politico sharky said quote this offered and i don't do a sharky impression so don't ask all right he says quote this <laughs> offer does not honor our teachers or our support staff including our lowest wage workers our teaching assistants hundreds of whom in 2024 of cps's proposed contract will still earn wages so low their children will be eligible for free school lunches and under federal poverty guidelines so Needless to say, but it looks like it's going to be another long week of negotiations. Once, uh, once again, the earliest possible walkout date would be October 7th. Yeah, if you notice, uh, Sharky's emphasis was on salaries. You're allowed to strike over salaries, folks, but you're not allowed to strike over stuff like class size uh, and uh, wraparound employees. It's like the things that matter the most to like students, well, I guess if your teacher is happy, that matters too, but the things that directly, closely directly impact students like class size, that's something you can't strike over. Everything is 
topsy-turvy. The logic is topsy-turvy uh, when it comes uh, to teachers and teachers' contracts and teachers' negotiations in the city of Chicago. And by the way, as I, I believe the city of Chicago is the only uh, – the, the only school system that limits its unionized workforce from striking over class size uh, and wraparound services. So he has to he has to carefully tailor, Shirky does, his rhetoric. Otherwise, Lori Life will get his lawyers and throw him in jail. There you go. Yeah, go cook kind of jelly bologna sandwiches, D. Not easy being a union leader here in the city of Chicago. Well, for what it's worth, bologna sandwiches are awesome. Wait, what's that, Bruce Rauner? Yay for our teachers! Oh, well. Yay for our teachers! <laughs> he loves us teachers. Still, uh, even after he's not governor. It's yeah. been like a year. Still loves still, those teachers. It's a funny way of showing it, by the way. Good for him. Oh, yeah. What's so, he doing now, I wonder? Oh, Bruce, right now. Oh, eating cheese. At, right now. Wine. Rollerblading. Right now. He was a big rollerblader. Yes, Remember he that? was. He was a, love rollerblading, <laughs> our former governor. <laughs> buying a house or selling a house. He loved houses. Every day, he's buying or selling another house. <laughs> oh, I just sold my house in Winnetka. Ugh. <laughs> I love houses. All right. So there you are. The latest of what's going on here locally. And uh, hey, don't go anywhere. Coming up, we got Maya Duke Masaba of the Chicago Reader coming on board here. And uh, stick around. It's the Ben Jarofsky Show live from the Chicago Sun-Times. Attention Chicago innovators and creators, 2019 Chicago Ideas Week is coming to the 12th through the 17th. This annual Ideas Festival is back, and it's the largest, most affordable Ideas Festival of its kind. They bring in hundreds of thought leaders from around the globe and some local to share ideas and spark action all across Chicago. To get a better idea of what to expect, here's a bit of audio from last year's Chicago Ideas Week with special guest and Chicago comedian Cameron Esposito. Everything that I have ever tried to do has had two motivations. One is I really do believe in trying to create social change. And then the other one is I'm scared and alone too. So I would like for you to join me. You know, every job that I try to make sure to hold the door open, that's like my uh, motto for, for um, like if I get through, you're coming with me. And I really, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And uh, especially if I have more privilege than I'm holding the door open for you um, even wider. October 12th through the 17th, it's 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. Tickets go on sale to members on August 22nd and to general public September 10th. Once again, if you're an innovator or creator in the city of Chicago or even outside the city, you must join us for Chicago Ideas Week, October 12th through the 17th. Head to chicagoideas.com. That's Chicago Ideas. Ideas.com, and we hope to see you October 12th through the 17th for 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. It's the butter cow, which has nine hearts to represent the nine essential nutrients in milk. That's right, it's made entirely out of butter, and it, you know, it's a state fair tradition since at least 1922. Thank you, overly excited reporter. Hey, it's the first Tuesday of the month, which means... It's time for First Tuesdays at the hideout. Isn't that right, Ben Jarofsky? Well, that is correct. So tell us what oh, it's about. I was just doing my, you know, imitation. That's correct. There we go. First Tuesday tonight, 630 at the hideout, 1354 West Wabansia. One more time, 1354 West Wabansia. McDumkey and I will have as our guests two Alder people. Alder man Matt Martin, pride of joy of the 47th Ward, and Alder woman Jeanette Taylor. Uh, Maya knows Jeanette very well, pride and joy of the 20th Ward. Let me tell you something, Jeanette Taylor, she tells it like it is, uh, and I'm really looking forward uh, to having Matt and Jeanette. We're going to be talking budgets, taxes, life in the city council. They're both first-term aldermen, first-time aldermen, so, you know, the adjustments a uh, rookie alderman have to go through, really. And uh, Obviously, we'll be talking teacher strike, their thoughts on the teacher strike. Uh, Maya has some interesting thoughts. We'll take a deeper dive with Maya about the role that the newly elected uh, progressive alderman can have uh, in helping our city reach some kind of accord without having really a messy strike. Uh, so they could play a role, ultimately, the newly elected alderman, particularly the Jeanette Taylors and Matt Martins, who are the progressive uh, variety of aldermen. So uh, that tonight, two progressive aldermen, Matt Martin, Jet Taylor, at the Hideout, 630, 1354 West Wabansia. It's Aldermania tonight at the Hideout. 
Alderman Matt Martin Ben's Alderman. That is correct. Oh, man. Who knows? He may get real geeky and ask some questions. I want my garbage can. <laughs> Alderman Matt Martin along with Alderwoman Jeanette Taylor. It's tonight at the hideout, 630, 1354 West Wabonzia. And if you can't make it live, don't worry. We'll have it streamed on the Ben Jarofsky Show Facebook page at Benny J Show. Hey, everybody. What you're about to hear are the piano stylings of Jeff Manuel. Man, listen to Jeff go. Jeff Manuel has been playing piano around Chicago for years. He's played for conventions, for celebrities, played in basement bars with blues bands. He's played at prestigious social clubs, fine restaurants, and in the intimacy of private homes. Book Jeff Manuel at jeffemanuelpianist.com. Don't worry, I'll spell his name at the end of this commercial. You know what Chicago Magazine said? They said that Jeff Manuel is, quote, as comfortable with Chopin as he is with Cole Porter. He's excellent, and his performance is joyous. He offers an elegant stream of compositions and interpretations that entertains the mind but won't hurt the ears. To hear more of Jeff Manuel's work and to book Jeff for your next event, go to jeffmanuelpianist.com. I'm going to spell it out for you, people. J-E-F-F. M as in Mary, A, N as in Nancy, U, E, L, P, I, A, N, I, S, T, dot com. Take it away, Jeff Manuel. Back to the Ben Jarofsky Show, live from the Chicago Sun Times. Maya on the piano, she's grooving. All right. You're on the piano. Oh, I'm on the, you're doing air something or other. Uh, so much to talk about with you, Maya. I believe those were air maracas, but oh, that were, were they air maracas? <laughs> it's a little like you're sort of like uh, bringing up Leo DiCaprio in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, a movie you've seen how many times? Once. Oh, you did see it. <laughs> yes. Uh, but you remember that little thing where he's dancing? Yeah, he's kind of, anyway. that's me. Um, all right. Uh, so much to talk about. Let's see. John Arena updates. I'd really love to get your thoughts on that. Lori and the teachers and the role that Progressive Alderman can play and the pending uh, school strike. Uh, Whistleblower Gate. If we get to that, I'd love to get your thoughts on Whistleblower Gate. But let's just start with fines, library fines. The news broke. Uh, D didn't have it in the update, but the news broke uh, that Lori Lightfoot had and, and the librarians, uh, the leaders of the Chicago Public Library, decide to do away with fines. Uh, forgive I, the debt. Forgive that's the outstanding. debt. Yeah, that's outstanding. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, and not just a one-time deal. You know, in the old days, they like sometimes they would just, all right, if you come in in the next week, we'll forgive the debt, return your books. Uh, pff, I've taken advantage of that a few times in my life. But this is permanent, as I understand. No more fines and fees. Uh, no more fines, anyway. Your thoughts on that, Maya? Uh, well, look, I think that uh, this jubilee is good <laughs> for the city of Chicago and for the readers of our city. Um, I, you know, I think that people, I bet there's lots of people out there who are haven't actually lost the books, but are not returning them because they're afraid to go back to the library with the books, then have they have to like deal with the fines. So, so the idea that uh, an institution like our public library system is moving away from some kind of punitive uh, type of practice that, um, you know, there's so many, there's so, there's so many ways to like uh, stimulate people returning or returning library books that doesn't involve like impacting their pocketbooks. Cause like why, why, you know, people, I don't know about you, but when I've, when I'm like late returning, my library book, it usually has something to do with like, I forgot when it was due. Like I didn't have time to stop at the library. Like it's, it's usually something pretty innocuous. So, uh, you know, for a lot of people dealing with the fines is, is not that big a deal, but I'm sure that there are lots of people who, you know, that's like money. They don't, they don't really have to spend anyway. And they're not returning the books cause they don't have the money. And then the well, library never gets the books and people, you know, people still don't have the money. So, you know, instead of, instead of like having like a punitive way to, to, to like 
coax people into returning their books on time, like why not reward the behavior we want to see? Such as like that if you don't, you know, that if you do return your books on time, you know, you can and you do it a certain number of times and then maybe you can take out more books at a time because you've been shown, you know, the, as a trustworthy borrower or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like there's there's just like so many more imaginative ways that that people can be like kind of like stimulated and coaxed into just like just just return the books, you yeah. know? And I think that we shouldn't be pursuing any kind of public policy that would in any way in like encourage di or discourage engagement with our public library system. Like we need people to be reading more, to be engaging with the library. So I think, and, and, and even like the, the news that I saw about this, you know, like the librarians are thrilled. Yeah. The librarians have not been thrilled to have to be like, you know, the sort of like, the 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 public face of this punishment you know that's levied against people who 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 mess up in this way i mean i hear i hear these kinds of conversations in like you know the criminal justice sphere a lot about how like okay well why do we have money bail like the idea is that like because people have their money tied up to showing back up to court that that's what's going to make them more likely to show up to court when like you know people don't show up to court most of the time if they don't show up it's because they like couldn't get childcare or they couldn't afford bus fare to get to the courthouse mm -hmm. for their, you know, next court date. So rather than like placing even more of a financial burden on people uh, when they've been accused of a crime, like one w solution is like to give people, you know, a bus pass with fare to get to court. So then there's like absolutely no way that they can find themselves in a situation where they can't afford to get to court. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think as far as library stuff goes, same same kind of deal. Like let's incentivize the behavior we want people to be practicing rather than just like, comp you know, operating out of this, this like paradigm of punishment all the time. Well, I, uh, it, it's, it's uh, $850,000 is the number I saw quoted in the, in the Sun-Times article, or maybe I think it was the Sun-Times article, $850,000 a year in fines that the library is forfeiting uh, by going to this policy. That's, I mean. Are they getting that money though? Is it really forfeiting it if you're never really getting it? That's a valid point. You never know. Uh, I, I do not know the answer to that question. You know, when peace, people start playing, I was just talking about this in regards to schools, games with budgets, Lord knows, uh, how whether what the money anything is, means. what anything means because the games people play with budgets uh, is is a whole art in and of itself. It, but this the, the funny thing is just like this notion with library, and, and I, I can tell you this. Wait, my I have to just confess, I've been used I've used libraries my whole life. I love libraries. Every week I go uh, to a library and get a book. I'm always using library. <laughs> the confession. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a confession. So I must confess, I've been uh, late on library books a long time, and when I many times, D, I'm starting to cry thinking about it with that music. Me and, too. Uh, and many of the time, I've been scared when I was a little, <laughs> like afraid to confront the librarian with the book because I was so shamed. And then you have to. You were scared when you were a kid. Yes, I'm made this deep confession time. Yes, I mean, I was, can, can you imagine? Like, why? Why do we want to? Like, can you I imagine how many kids, how many kids are out there who might be experiencing similar feelings, and they're like not going to go to the library because they literally don't want to deal with that fear? Like, what a warped, like what a warped way to live to have like society be operating. I, I got to <laughs> tell you, there's yes, I agree with you. Uh, this falls in the category we were talking about. We had Dan Savage on last week. Like what's going on with the schools that made young men in the 60s and the 70s strip naked to go swimming? You know what I'm saying? Like I, you're looking at me like this, this is a policy that occurred. It's not directly related to library fines, but there's like constantly the shame that that people are and this, uh, you know, this guilt or whatever. But yes, going back to library libraries and moving away from swimming naked in gym class. Uh, yes, the, the, I would be afraid to go back to libraries of Barris. And that's when, when they had those reprieves every now and then, the furloughs or whatever they call it, where they, for a week they would let you bring your books but back. Then, but then if that, that if then it's like, oh, everybody knows this is the week that you get a reprieve, <laughs> then to go, you yeah. like identify yourself it's as true. a delinquent, you know, like yeah. to, in that time, in that window of time. Like, I don't know. It's, it's, I just feel like the more we can disassociate reading from punishment of any sort, the better off we're all here, gonna be. <laughs> here, and I think you said that there was a quote somewhere that librarians are jumping over the circulation desk. It was so excited, ju <laughs> jubilation. <laughs> jubilation, uh, so anyway, but I've been very good, very prompt. I give myself one week on every library book. I only check out one book. and if God I, bless. Yes, and I either have read it or I have not read it, and I return it, because guess what? 
there's thousands of other books out there. I could check out any one. All right. So yes, it's I agree. Impressive, with, you could read a book in a week. A lot of well, people I can't a, do that. I I have a lot of sleep issues that we will not get into. But mm -hmm. many times at three thirty in the morning, if you wake up to go drink a water, just think of me up there. That's what I'm doing. I'm not so old yet that I'm waking up to drink water in the oh, middle of the night. All right. Well, okay. It's coming. Uh, it's coming. Yes. So it's one. It's just one of the benefits of getting old. All right. Speaking of moving on, which is what we're going to do, Alderman John Arena. He got a new gig. What a, a former up. alderman, huh? Let's talk what about. I wonder if he had any library late fees, huh? <laughs> I wonder yeah. if they made him pay it before he gets his gig. The, Johnny Arena, 45th Ward, go the, ahead. The kids call it a glow up. I mean, look, he's he's bouncing from, you Wait, know. what do they call it? A glow up. What's a glow up? Did you know about that, Dave? Like, a, like you know, like know he's up. in a better situation. He got, he's he was kicked when, you know, and, and he was down, but now he's in a way better situation, basically. I mean, he's he lost his election, you know, basically, over his crusade for affordable housing for his ward, mm -hmm. in which a lot of people were quite, you know, pissed at the idea that there would be there would be housing set aside for lower income families and neighbors that they have, uh, veterans and old people, et cetera. So John Arena now, uh, as of I think yesterday, Heather Tyrone from the Daily Line um, broke this news uh, that he is now going to be an advisor, like a senior advisor in the Department of Planning and Development, um, which is going to be run by, um, God, what is, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name. Um, anyway, this is like Maurice Cox. Uh, he's, he's, he's kind of seen as this like renegade um, visionary in, in, in the urban planning and, uh, development space. Uh, he's coming from Detroit and, um, yeah. So, so John Arena is going to be working there now. I mean, the, the headline around this and, and much of the, and like the sort of high up in, in the story, uh, it was like prominently like arena's new salary is prominently featured mm -hmm. and how he's going to be making more money than he was as an alderman. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't have, I don't really have an opinion on that. That's, I mean, I don't, I don't think discussing how much he's making, like we don't even know what he's gonna be doing. Like if in a year from now, it turns out that he's like really not doing much and making that much money, then I feel like that'll be like, okay, like why is he making so much money? But um, for now, like I don't really have an opinion about it one way or another. Like uh, it seems like potentially he could be doing much more for the city in this job than he was as Alderman of the 45th Ward. So um, yeah, it's, um, you know, his fellow Northwest side alderman, like Anthony Napolitano up there. He's, he's not happy at this news. He yeah. thinks it was a bad idea. Um, but uh, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what he's going to do in this position. Well, the, what do you think about it? Well, the I, I want to find that story because Napolitano's quote was pretty funny. Uh, I had many. Uh, oh, yeah. Let me pull it up. Yeah, pull it. Uh, I had many feelings when I read uh, the story. It was in today's bright one. Uh, and uh, but it had been texted to me also by other people like, hey, look at what Arena's up to. Uh, number one, John Arena, I thought was going to become state rep. If you recall, Rob Martwick moved up to state senator. Uh, there was like a bumping game. There was a, guy, a state senator named John Moreau became a Cook County judge, and so uh, uh, M Rob Markwick advanced from state rep to state senator, leaving a vacancy. Mm -hmm. And all the scuttlebutt was that John Arena, who's a committeeman of the 45th Ward. Uh, would join forces with other committeemen in the area to select himself uh, to replace Martwick, and then he didn't. And mm -hmm. I was like, "What's going on? What are we up to?" And uh, so, the, the, <laughs> and then, oh, this is what he's up to. So, in terms of salary, no, twice. I don't think if it's twice as much because all of no, make I mean like from state. Like it's not twice as much. I exaggerated. State rep, I think, makes sixty-eight grand. Don't quote me on this, and he'll make one hundred twenty-four. So, or you know, he, here's. It, I don't know if that's twice as much, almost twice as much. Uh, but the point is, I was like smiling. Look at John Arena, quick, a smooth move, Johnny. Glow up. Yeah, glow it's a glow up, up Ben. Glow up, yeah. uh, so, so this is the quote that was in Heather Chiron's story from Anthony Napolitano. Yeah. <laughs> quote, he shouldn't be advising anyone on anything, Napolitano said, adding that he believed Arena took, a, took the job with the city to weasel, quote unquote, <laughs> weasel his way into a municipal pension. He doesn't work well with other aldermen and residents. He's a bully. Wow. Well, it's funny how the bully word gets thrown around uh, toward people who dare to speak up uh, to powerful mayors, at least with Mayor Rahm. Uh, many of the aldermen, we had Ray Lopez in here. You were we started talking about Scott Wagus back and they call Scott Wagus back a bully. And I disagree with that language uh, when 
well, it's mainly Anthony Beal who does it, and Ray Lopez did it as well. They call Scott Wagesman. They call aldermen who stand up to Rahm Emanuel bullies, yeah, bull, I mean, which is look, a really misuse of the absurd. word bully. Rahm Emanuel was a bully. Ed Burkos may be a bully. Like, none of these people in city council right now, I mean, very few of them, I would say, c like, classify in the bully category. Most of them are followers and they're most of them are cowards. Well, like they're not, they don't have an, a single original idea. They're not, they're like, they're not gonna come out from underneath their rock until they really, really have to, until they see some kind of gain for themselves personally in speaking out about anything. So, you know, some people have a little more guts than others, but like calling someone a bully, like a bully almost have to has to have some kind of leadership skills. You know what I mean? Like they have to have, I mean, the classic idea is that like bullies are actually like super insecure. And so they use this way of like, of like being mean to people and making them feel bad to make themselves feel strong. But you still have to have some kind of sense of like that y you can wield power. I think most aldermen are like way, like way too like spineless to be like, Asserting themselves to wield any, wield any kind of power for any reason. <laughs> All right, so let's just talk about John Arena and the role he could potentially have. Uh, and this is perhaps the most legitimate policy angle of the story, as opposed to me calculating how much more money the glow up will mean for John Arena. I mean, it's not that much more money. Well, sixty-eight thousand to. <laughs> well, uh, but but compared to what he made as alderman, it was like a hundred and seventeen thousand dollars as alderman, and now he's going to be making one hundred twenty-three. Jesus Christ, these are like, maybe I should go become a politician. Maybe. <laughs> I don't think maybe. I have to have any more degrees for that. Like Maybe. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, the difference between a writer, a reporter. Nobody's going to vote day for me, though. Let's be real. Uh, the hardest part will be getting on the ballot, okay? Mm -hmm. That's what I always say. People, Man, you should run for You office. have to be a bully to get on the ballot. That is correct. Or, or you have, have some bullies working for thank you. Thank you. I don't That's have that kind point. of connection. So here's the thing. I give John Arena had a reputation. If you're going to say a, a bully, he had a reputation of having an explosive temper. And I admit, I know many people in the 45th Ward, longtime activists, who uh, are filled with stories about how John Arena yelled at him. So I would say that if if you're ever going to call him a quote unquote bully, you would deal with it, that would that would be the aspect. Definitely not and how he dealt with other city, uh, aldermen or the mayor of Chicago. And I applaud John Arena for having the guts to stand up to Rom. That said, he's now part of a team. He's a team player. He's on the Lori team. Lori mm -hmm. has hired him for her department of planning to sort of oversee. Yeah, she didn't hire him to be a thorn in her side. That's that for sure. is correct. She didn't hire him to come on the Ben Jarofsky show and talk about how, you know, he supports the teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, yay or, for our teachers. Yay for our teachers, <laughs> you know, to come to the Ben Jarofsky show and talk about how he's against a TIF expenditure for Lincoln Yards. Mm -hmm. He's now a team player. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the team that he's playing on, the housing team, the planning team of Lori Lightfoot. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, look, the housing team of Lori Light, like, let me just say that I feel like there's been like pretty scant evidence of like major changes in how housing issues are being handled. I feel like they're still in sort of the settling in phase at City Hall with, with, with you know, large scale planning and policy stuff related to affordable housing, especially. Um, you know, the... <laughs> I, this resuscitated Department of Housing, at, at, you know, that that has been like a, a big hallmark of her administration so far. I am like very excited to see what those folks are going to do. That department is getting filled up with people who are pretty widely respected in the in the affordable housing development sphere and are generally seen as people who are, you know, progressive and very thoughtful about you know, and knowledgeable about the mistakes the city made in the past and how things could be better and all this stuff. So this Department of Housing is like getting really filled up with like all kinds of very interesting uh, people with the with good ideas and I think a lot of will to implement them. But I'm not seeing, I'm not understanding yet, like what are they gonna be doing? Like, what are they doing? Like what, so far it doesn't seem like they're like, they they haven't like come out publicly with any initiatives yet. So. You know, I feel like I'm still waiting to see what that's going to amount to. Um, you know, again, planning and development, there's this trailblazer type person that's going to be leading that uh, that kind of wing of things. Still not clear what that's going to mean. We're going to have a new head of the CHA, uh, like Gene Jones is out. Like, what is that going to mean? There's, there's, um, I just still feel like, no, like nothing has materialized out of all these changes. Like the faces have changed. 
there some of these faces like nominally you know these are the people who are have a lot of ideas and like are 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 um not just kind of like from a lineage of like political stool pigeons you know there there are people who are like have been chosen for the correct qualifications and seems um but you know are they going to be really empowered and able to like really do some things or are they just there to like boost Lori's credibility as like a progressive leader but aren't really going to have any aren't really going to be empowered to well when we talk about uh, housing needs in the city of chicago uh I would say the most pressing housing need in terms of affordability is uh, maintaining some some level of affordability in the city, and um, we had a, we were talking about this last week in relation to the city's. There's like three potential strikes that could happen in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Park district employees are, are voted to go on strike, and uh, which right with the teachers and right with the uh, security guards, et cetera, at the public uh, schools as well. And one of the um, uh, points raised by the leaders of the park district is that Chicago has become too expensive to live in. And, mm -hmm. and, and as a, I, an old timer like me, Maya, um, <laughs> it's a little surprising to hear that because again, as I like to point out, Mayor Daley, the original Mayor Daley implemented res residency requirements for city employees because he wanted to stabilize the city. And he viewed city employees as sort of a middle-class bulwark against white flight, against income flight, mm -hmm. uh, against uh, Chicago becoming a poorer and poorer city. And now we're hearing from the union leaders, from the activists, from the workers themselves, that Chicago's become too expensive. And so if you're if you're Lori Lightfoot and you're trying to stitch together a housing policy, my guess is that would be at the top of the list. And I don't know, and I, it's too early to tell as you say, but I don't know, like in her heart of hearts, if Lori Lightfoot wants to take that deep dive into uh, housing policy and implement uh, programs that might, what? rent control perhaps, more subsidies uh, for uh, employees, uh, for, for uh, lower wage people to get them to be able to afford to live in Chicago, use that CHA money to build more affordable housing. I don't know where she's going. I know that Mayor Rahm wanted nothing to do with any of that. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the fight with John Arena in the 45th yeah. Ward and Napolitano, your good friend, in the 41st <laughs> Ward. So I don't know where Lori wants to go with all yeah, this. Yeah, I don't know either. And it's like, I just feel like it's just and after announcement in this space that sort of plays very well in certain kind of progressive circles of people who are really engaged with trying to have more affordable housing in the city blah 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 but like i just haven't seen yet like what does that mean like what are they doing well what are, what are they doing you should have marisa navarro on here you should ask her on what what are they doing at the department of housing last time i talked to her she said that they weren't ready to be like speaking publicly in like their what like to be like taking a public position about anything yet that was like well, a month ago one yeah that was a month ago yeah, yeah. well all right one thing at the also at the top of the list is property taxes Pro rising property taxes forces up the cost of housing throughout the city of chicago this is one of the main reasons i've been crusading all these years about property taxes and tips etc because that tips is surcharge on the property tax and so it this is connected to what forms of revenue Lori Lightfoot is going to seek to finance government uh, in lieu of property taxes. In other words, is she going to raise the property taxes uh, for the school contract and for her new budget? Uh, if she does that, makes Chicago that less affordable because property taxes go up. Renters generally pay more money in rent because the landlord's going to pass the costs on to them. So and that middle class of, you know, the that that city worker middle class whatever, a lot of them are homeowners. So like, yeah, I mean, look, you, you the property tax problem is not going to be solved by like squeezing the city worker, you know, living in South Shore or Jefferson Park or whatever. Like the the problem is that too many of the property taxes that could be going to the city are tied up in these TIF districts and the commercial the way the the commercial property taxes are all messed up like these you know like the, these 
big properties downtown are not paying nearly enough into municipal coffers. And that's like a, a whole disgusting predatory system that feeds all these polit you know, politicians who have the property tax appeal businesses. Like all of that is like the real problem. You know, like you're not going to solve this problem by like raising the city property taxes more on just like regular Joe homeowners. Um, you know, rich people need to be paying more in taxes. And furthermore, I mean, you know that this is like an issue for me, but I just feel like we were the play, the, the like, the county needs, like desperately needs more property tax revenue. Like the county is, is starving for property taxes. They should have been taking for years just through just just through inflation adjusted increases you know that they haven't been taking because it's been too scary politically i wrote about this last year you know this this that's where like if property taxes are going to go up like they the county needs them m more than the city does well you They're know the game they play the county uh is voluntarily uh re put a cap on the property taxes that they take the mayor this is the this is an age-old game that mayor daly invented with john stroger and that enables the mayor to raise property taxes generally on schools and through tiffs uh to fortify his or her needs and so that's just the game they and play they can, and they can play the game because the who needs the county is poor people the, those property can uh, taxes that the county needs are going to pay f mostly for public health and public safety uh, institutions and who's relying on Stroger Hospital as their primary form of, of, of health care? It's poor people, you know, and it's and same thing with the criminal justice system. Like the the the, the drying up revenue there is uh, is making things worse for the justice system, for the conditions in the justice system that disproportionately affects poor people. Yeah. So like, you know, like people like the the middle class city worker kind of you know, layer of people are not necessarily even touched by mm -hmm. these like starving county institutions. So I don't know. It's a big mess. The 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 and and everything sort of has to like the untangling this has to be about like making the wealthy people and wealthy businesses pay their fair share of their taxes, and which also, they are not right now. And I'll repeat what I think I said to you last week when we had sort of the same conversation. Remember last week, I had just come back from uh, UIC talking to a class, a political science class, Dick Simpson, former alderman, Dick mm -hmm. Simpson was in the room and he pointed out, and I gotta give him credit for this. I, I had not been, um, I had not thought about this enough and not said this enough that we should be part of a larger conversation with cities across the country for an urban agenda. Because right now what you're talking about is trying to figure out a way to get out of these, uh, these to, to finance these programs and get out of these budget crises just on our own. So what tax do we employ locally as opposed to having the collective of cities throughout the country with an urban agenda uh, demanding that uh, Washington help out as well. And I, I believe that in addition to looking at local remedies for these situations, Maya, we should be part of a larger conversation. And, and that, frankly, that disturbs me because I don't see that anywhere. I mean, I could talk forever about how Democrats are trying to come together to impeach uh, President Trump. I'd like to see some evidence that Democrats are coming together you know, like Milwaukee Democrats, Cleveland Democrats, Sacramento Democrats mm -hmm. to try to get the federal government to kick in a little more to help cities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like this is this is uh, that the federal kind of remittances through like, you know, block grants and other and other kind of appropriations that the federal government gives for urban development. Like this was huge in mid-century. This was what allowed to these massive, massive urban renewal programs and construction of public housing, like these massively transformational um, things that were also very destructive for American cities. Like these were financed by the federal government, mm -hmm. essentially. Like cities could not have done that on their own. Yeah. Uh, and you're right. I mean, I think that there needs to be some kind of push for that. The problem is that, you know, you see what's going on over there. Like the, does, the, does, does the Department of Housing and Urban Development, like what do they even do there anymore? Like the, press you know, conferences. Yeah. Press conferences. Ben Carson, Carson has a press conference yeah. every, you know, few months. Uh, it's, it's, and even, even, you know, it doesn't even matter. Like it doesn't even matter who he is. That's yeah. the point. It doesn't matter that he has that job, what his attitude about HUD is, whatever. Like that there, this is, 
this is a system in which like that is an area of government that's like nobody's giving any love to just like ideologically just doesn't fit in it is it's not what's seen as mattering yeah well, I just think this was absent even before the um, uh, the Republicans took over. But you're right. You can't. There's not going to be any aid or assistance from this current administration. So it would be predicated on a change. Uh, it, it, you know, a different president, obviously. But I didn't see any talk of urban, uh, a common urban agenda during the days when, let's say, Barack Obama was the president and Rahm Emanuel was the mayor. How about that? Two Democrats, one worked for the other. Right. I mean, it's even like <laughs> there's the, 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 the truth is that like even in the whatever worst case scenario for Democrats, like still this guy is going to be out of there like in what is it? Five years. Like even if Trump got reelected, like he'll be out of there in five years. Five years is probably about what you would need to pull together such a massive national urban movement of like getting all of these different municipal leaders on the same page, figuring out some kind of agenda, figuring out their demands, like or organizing, mm -hmm. organizing, you know, that's what you need. And that will take time. And whatever, whatever their priorities are now with regards to the 20, you know, 2020 election, like they either have like one year or five, five years, because yeah. then in four to eight years, things are might change again. And you know, who even knows? Like we could have another Republican president if it wasn't for Trump. So this is like, this requires like longer term thinking, like on a decade range. And I don't, like I really don't think that kind of Lori Lightfoot being like the mayor of like the third largest city in America could certainly be like at the, at the vanguard of, of pushing for something like that. But you know, I don't even, I'm, it's not even clear to me what her priorities are. Cause again, it's all a lot of window dressing that looks like something is going in a progressive direction, but like, I'm not, I'm not seeing what that means yet. Well, one of the thing at the top of her list of priorities at the moment, I would say is to, uh, come to a contract agreement with the Chicago teachers union, uh, without a strike. And, uh, I guess that's probably a good point to leave it now. Uh, cause when Misha Patel has showed up and Carlos Ramirez Rose is on his way, but I get, I predict that next week at this time, Maya, you and I will be up to our eyeballs and talk about a pending teacher strike. Let's see today's the, so, yeah. So the te actually the teachers could be on strike next week. I'm looking at a Misha. Is that I, right? Um, I don't have that many contacts in the rank and file, but I've the lost... ones I do, they seem pretty confident it's happening. So yeah, no, they, they, the, I just I've lost track of the calendar. I just can't remember when the the, the first day they can strike. Well, maybe it. Bruce Rauner knows. Yay, Yay for our teachers! Yay for our teachers! I think October eighth. So we, yeah. it could be next week on this time. We'll mm -hmm. be talking more about this. Uh, Maya, thank you so much uh, for uh, coming by every Tuesday. Maya. Isha Patel is on deck. We're going to bring her on. Carlos uh, Ramirez Rosa uh, is en route. Uh, he's. I'm probably riding his bike. It takes a while. You know what I'm saying? Parking. I, <laughs> I can, I feel that. Uh, she feels his pain. All right. Thank you very much, Maya. We'll be right back with Amisha Patel after this. When you lose a loved one whose wishes were to be cremated, Chicagoland Cremation Options provides your family a dignified and affordable cremation service. Chicagoland Cremation Options helps you bypass the expensive overhead of a funeral home or cemetery by streamlining the cremation directly. It saves you sometimes thousands of dollars. Chicagoland Cremation Options Crematory, just south of O'Hare, five minutes west of Chicago. It's a family-owned business operated by my good friend, Douglas Klein. You can find them at ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. One more time, ChicagolandCremationOptions.com. Quick. If the mayor has baked this into the budget, then it should be very easy then to put it in writing, right? It's already there. And so that's the dilemma that she has before her. Our members have spoken. The city of Chicago has spoken. Our fight is not a new fight. We have had the same line, the same demands, the same proposals for the last 10 years years the chickens have come home to roost put it in writing today's ben jaromsky show was brought to you in part by chicago architecture center get to know your city on one of chicago architecture center's 65 walking tours hear the unforgettable secrets and stories behind chicago architecture from our expert docents Book your tour at architecture.org slash tours. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm actually on a tour right now. 
Oh, wow. Look at that building. Get a special discount for Illinois residents from July 15th to August 15th. All Illinois residents get 50% off select walking tours. Visit architecture.org slash IL dash resident. All right. To anybody that's uh, watching or listening on the live stream, we're going to take a quick little pause here. Our guest, Carlos Ramirez Rosa, has arrived. So don't go anywhere. The Ben Jarofsky Show continues. How about that banner, huh? That logo, sweet. All right, everybody, Carlos is here, and we are ready for hour number two. But before we get into hour number two of the Ben Jaromsky Show, remember, it's brought to you by the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150, and our good friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. Sorry for the delay there, everybody, but hour number two, we're ready. It is Tuesday, October 1st, and live from the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Reader Studio on Racine Avenue, 
This is The Ben Jarofsky Show. In this hour of the program, it's the return of our favorite grassroots organizer, Amisha Patel, and also making his return, the 35th Ward Alderman himself, the one, the only, Carlos Ramirez Rosa! And now your host. That was my Michael Buffer impression. That was good, man. Let's get ready to rumble. Let's get ready to rumble. Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Yes, Carlos Ramirez Rosa and Amisha Patel in the studios. Good God. Like the two of the leading progressives in the city in one room at one time. Don't tell anybody in charge. (laughs) They might arrest all of us. Anyway, Amisha, Carlos, welcome back. It's always fun to have you guys on. Um, God, so much to talk about. First, let's start. Amisha, give the update. You started giving the update to me uh, off mic. Let's do it on mic. Uh, the Lincoln Yards lawsuit, grassroots collaborative, just to remind everybody, filed suit uh, against the Lincoln Yards TIF deal shortly after it was passed by uh, the city council uh, on the grounds that it was illegal, uh, racially discriminatory, and a, a, a circuit court judge, a mayor, I should point out, Mayor Lori Lightfoot brought in lawyers from City Hall to fight the suit on the grounds that you had no standing to file it, and a circuit court judge agreed, and the suit got thrown out of court. Am I accurate in my summation? You are accurate. That is what happened. That's correct. <laughs> That's Robert <laughs> Mueller agreeing with All you. All kinds of confirmations. Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, we are, of course, really disappointed in Judge Cohen's decision. Um, we, of course, believe we do have standing. We wouldn't have filed this lawsuit if we didn't think that we had standing. Um, and so we are exploring our legal options and in terms of what our next steps are. I think what's important to say is that the judge did not rule on the actual merits of the case. Um, and that is the conversation we are committed to having um, because we know that, again, the TIF statute, was, that the city was in violation of TIF statute and also that the city was in violation of Civil Rights Act of Illinois through the creation of this TIF district in the whitest, wealthiest part of our state um, to say that it was blighted, it was incorrect. And people have seen the Tribune, hopefully the Tribune investigation on the property tax, the, the tax value information that clearly showed that um, it, that the property taxes were ri- the property values were rising in that neighborhood for the third year in a row, and certainly were no sign and um, no end in sight for the rising of that value. That this was um, an abuse of policy, it was abuse of um, and manipulation, and we are committed to continue to organize, to fight, to make sure that we can we, we fix this, mm-hmm. because we can't keep having this happen. Folks in the city have we've been seeing it time after time after time. Um, and I think a legal strategy is a good one. It's an additional way that we've you know, added to our organizing. We're continuing, again, to explore our options. But we also will keep fighting in all kinds of ways to really make sure that we bring real, um, real change to the TIF system and, 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 and an end to these massive handouts to wealthy developers. Carlos, what's your uh, take on Well, this? kudos uh, to Amisha and the uh, collaborative for you know, picking up this very extremely important fight. Um, I'm just disappointed that, you know, it's not Mayor Light leading the charge to say, let's unravel this and look at this uh, TIF deal and, uh, you know, what my predecessor and uh, the previous council did. Um, But nonetheless, it's uh, another example of the way that the city is uh, abusing the TIF system. Um, You know, really, TIFs are supposed to be for blighted areas. Uh, The focus of the TIF is to raise the equalize assessed value of the TIF district so that once the role of developing that area. It can uh, add more uh, properties that are going to contribute uh, greatly to uh, the property tax rules. Uh, and in this instance, we already know that that area, that, that land, you know, did not need a TIF. Uh, the EAV was set at zero? Well, it was, it was originally under a different use. Right? The zoning designation changed from industrial to, and that was part of the thing is that the, it was that, that starting point was a totally different starting point. And once that change happened, you saw consistently the values start to increase. And if the city had not passed it the moment that they did, um, those other, the third year of values would have come forward. And so, um, it was a clear, like, you know, I think there's a clear strategy that the ROM played 
played the left foot um, and played played her successfully, was able to get her to, you know, like that saying like, oh, if the if light foot disagrees, we're not going to move it. I don't think that's ever was true. We, what Amisha and Carlos are getting into the intricacies of TIF law, uh, <laughs> and it is a murky uh, terrain to go through. But the bottom line is there are laws that are supposedly govern the use of this, uh, the, this mechanism for raising money to finance development deals in poor neighborhoods that but for that TIF or not, would not get any development. And I think absolutely everybody in the city of Chicago, if they were being honest, would agree that uh, exhibit A of a neighborhood that does not need assistance to be developed is the area around North and Elston Avenue on uh, this just e east of your ward, Carlos. It's one of the fastest growing areas in the city. There's development that's going on all along. If left alone, like a free market economy, we are the home of the University of Chicago free market economy system if it was left alone it would develop on its own uh, instead what they have to do is take advantage of the little quirks in the law to uh, justify it having this designation that's supposed to help poor neighborhoods and one quirk in the law is that you cannot be outpacing the rest of the city in the rise of your value of your property and still get the designation <laughs> so they got advantage of some like the way, first of all the way they 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 designed the TIF in such a way is to keep out the real rising property value the whole thing's a scam don't get me going carlos <laughs> so uh anyway uh, what I don't understand, and help me out here, is why Lori Lightfoot would be leading the charge to fight the lawsuit. Why would Lori Lightfoot be setting the lawyers in to fight Amisha Patel's grassroots collaborative? Why don't she just look the other way and say, well, let's see uh, how the judge rules on this. What's your thoughts, young man? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a question for Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Um, you know, I, I think as a candidate, Mayor Lightfoot was very clear that she was opposed to the TIF. And this was one of the big issues of this mayoral campaign uh, was the question of, uh, you know, what is your stance on Lincoln Yards? What would you do if you're mayor now? What will you do if you become mayor as it relates to uh, this mega TIF alongside the 73? And uh, Mayor Lightfoot was very clear. I was at a very early press conference uh, with uh, then candidate Mayor Lightfoot, where she, alongside other candidates, uh, stood there and said that they were opposed to Lincoln Yards and they were going to. I don't know what in her personal process of thinking changed after she was elected. Uh, I do believe that, you know, when she was, uh, you know, in the process of assuming the office and Rom turned to her and said, we'll hold it if Mayor Lightfoot, you know, uh, if Mayor Elect Lightfoot uh, puts her, uh, you know, foot down and says, no, don't move forward with this. I think she she should have done that. And she just said, I don't want you to move forward with it. And, and if it was a bluff, if Rom was tricking her, then let Rom trick her, mm -hmm. right? And, and let him actually, not let him trick her rather, mm -hmm. let him come forward and then say, actually, no, I'm lying. And you know, we're not gonna defer to the incoming mayor. We're gonna move forward with this. But at minimum, you know, she would have made it very clear where she stood uh, on this issue. And I think now it, it's, we're in very murky territory. We don't know why she flip-flopped, why she changed. Uh, and I, I think that that's a question that really the, the press has not really held Mayor Lightfoot to account. Well, it's a complicated guy. Uh, whenever you get into TIF law, it's a very complicated thing. I'm defending the press. It's so complicated. <laughs> uh, uh, well, all right, let's let's move the TIFs to a side and talk. Uh, I want to talk teachers uh, strike with you, but let's put that here. Well, long we're talking property taxes, uh, Misha and Carlos, I'd uh, love to get your thoughts on this one. We're heading down and uh, not only we're we heading toward a uh, teacher strike, but we're heading closer to when uh, Lori Life is actually going to have to put a budget uh, on the table, proposed budget on the table, and figure out how we're going to finance government uh, in the coming year. Uh, I have a sense that both of you have uh, recommendations you would like to give her as to ways to raise money. I'll start with you, Amisha, what are, and then go to you, Carlos. What, uh, what are your recommendations to Lori Lightfoot? Well, we've been, um, along with a coalition of organizations, been really working for months on thinking about this first budget of Lightfoot. And our framing of this is pretty clear. We want a budget that invests in neighborhoods and communities, divests from policing, and really is rooted in progressive revenue solutions at the city level, right? The city is notorious for saying, well, we can't do anything. Let's look at the state. It's on, it's on the state's job. Well, the, there are, there's work to be done at each level. So um, at, in terms of revenue, to your question, one of the key things that we are um, fighting for is a reinstatement of the corporate head tax. So this, um, this, if people remember in 2011, 
Rahm Emanuel's first budget um, did two key things. Uh, it He eliminated the corporate head tax, which charged uh, corporations um, with over 50 employees a per employee um, tax to, for doing business in Chicago. Um, at the same time that he gave that money back to corporate Chicago, he uh, closed men public mental health clinics saying there wasn't money. And so a key thing for us is that we actually, our demand is very much linked, which is that we need to reopen public mental health clinics in the city of Chicago, and we need to reinstate a corporate head tax um, so that businesses who are um, profiting off of being in the city and are, um, you know, aren't paying their share of, uh, um, of taxes into, um, for the money that they're making, this needs to shift. And so that's a key demand that we're pushing forward. On divestment, for us, it's even, it, divesting actually on policing is about holding the line. Holding the line on the police budget would actually be divesting because every year that police budget climbs. And so, um, you know, that, and when we think about where that money instead should be going in terms of um, violence prevention and community, you know, restorative justice and community based interventions, like that's actually what will make our community safer. So for us, it's been really to try to think about things like mental health clinics, affordable housing investments, but also, and here's some ways that we can actually pay pay for this. Of course, TIF, the TIF, this connects back into TIFs as well, as everyone knows, right? Like the TIF um, kitty is growing um, wildly, and um, we expect that she'll do some surplus, um, you know, to be able to move move money back into the different taxing bodies. But I think, um, you know, there is no. I think there we need bold solutions that really um, that sh are a shift away from putting everything on the backs of poor people. And there's ways that Lightfoot is doing that in terms of the fees and fines, amnesty. There's work that's happening, but I think this property tax question is is looming. And that's if that's where the bulk of this money is going to come from for this budget. That's a real problem. Carlos. You know, the, the property tax question is a huge one, and that is a major driver of displacement in the city of Chicago. It's why people are losing their homes in record numbers in certain neighborhoods because they're unable to pay their property tax bill and it goes up to the scavenger auction uh, and they, they lose their property for pennies on the dollar. Uh, it's the reason why we see so many people choosing to sell before they reach that point. Because if you're getting that property tax bill and it's growing and growing and growing year after year, and you're an older person on a fixed income, or you're a working class person, you just cannot you know, survive. And so one of the things that's really pushing uh, working poor uh, uh, black people, Latinx people, white people, people of all backgrounds and races out of the city of Chicago are these uh, skyrocketing property taxes. So the question then is, well, what's the alternative, right? Because we're told over and over again by the Tribune and the Sunday Times uh, you know, that the only responsible thing that we can do is raise property taxes. And look at how, uh, you know, uh, our property taxes compared to those in the suburbs. The reality is that Illinois and the city of Chicago and Chicagoland rely more on property taxes than almost any other, uh, you know, city or municipality in the nation uh, or state. And the reason why is because of the regressivity that's existed at the state level for so long, uh, the refusal uh, on the part of previous administrations to move forward with progressive revenue, but at the local and state level. Luckily, we've seen some action now at the state level, uh, you know, and we're moving in the direction of having a graduated or fair income tax. But while we're waiting for that change to take place, the question is, what can the city of Chicago do now? And what we're being told by the Lightfoot administration is that what the city of Chicago can do now is go to Springfield and ask in the veto session that all these uh, state legislators that just voted to move forward on uh, the fair tax, to just move forward on a lot of uh, legislation to now uh, give the city of Chicago uh, some relief in some different ways. Uh, so that includes restructuring the way that we would look to do a casino in the city of Chicago. And that includes a real estate transfer tax. Um, and let's be very clear, the state legislature has already given the city of Chicago a way to increase the real estate transfer tax. It's through a referendum process. And candidate uh, Lightfoot said that she would support the grassroots initiative from the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless uh, to move forward with the Bring Chicago Home Ordinance that would put a referendum on the ballot uh, as soon as March of 2020 uh, to ask voters, do you support raising the real estate transfer tax? Uh, 
by uh, ooh, what's it? 0.8 percent or mm -hmm. is it 1.2 percent on properties over one million dollars yeah. on sales and that would bring in potentially 100 million for homeless services to build affordable housing uh yeah. since then now mayor lightfoot has pivoted and said well actually we're not going to do that we're going to go down to springfield and ask them to just either allow the city council to vote to raise the real estate transfer tax and bypass a referendum or to ask Springfield to just do it themselves and raise the real estate transfer tax and dedicate that revenue towards our city's uh, pension liabilities. The reality is, is that I don't think we're going to get that outcome in the veto session in Springfield. And so we really have to disabuse ourselves of that notion that Springfield's coming to the rescue. The question is, what can we do now? And the reality is, is that there are a whole plethora of progressive revenue options like reinstating the corporate head tax that the city of Chicago can pursue right now uh, and that would help us either avoid a property tax increase or diminish uh, what a property tax increase would look like. All right, uh, let's get into some of those alternatives. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, the head tax, uh, what other alternatives are you talking about? So we can look at raising uh, the hotel tax. Uh, the city of Chicago, uh, when you look at just the hotel tax that the city of Chicago levies, it is lower than other cities. Uh, now, there are other taxes on hotels downtown uh, that do impact that, uh, but we could look at the that we can look at is uh, when it comes to ride share, we can also look at a very aggressive TIF surplus. Uh, so as Amisha pointed out, there was a uh, record haul in TIF, aggressively surplusing that money so that we can, uh, you know, bring in uh, serious uh, cash uh, for the city of Chicago to address its liabilities this year. Um, let's see, do you want to share some, Amisha? I mean, I think those are some of the big ones that we are also thinking you know, looking at and pushing for. Um, I know it's less things that we've worked on, but the idea, and this, I think Lightfoot has even talked about it herself, we'll see, but of uh, luxury, you know, tax on luxury services, um, that if, you know, pr appropriately focused, again, really make sure that those who have, um, you know, access to gardeners and whatever else are actually you know, are yeah. getting tax for those services. Um, but I do think there's, and then there's also work that the city could be doing to be really advocating for the state level changes to also bring in more money. Like we never saw that under Emmanuel. He never pushed, he always like pointed fingers to say, oh, I can't do anything, but never did any work to try to actually get the state to make the changes at the state level that were necessary to move Chicago forward. So, um, you know, I think that with all of this, like for us, our focus really is about um, how do we fight to keep people in Chicago who live here and mm -hmm. whose home this is? Um, the issue of displacement, as Carlos mentioned, is is enormous, and both people, you know, leaving for all kinds of reasons, but including the fact that this place not only is it unaffordable, but you're actually not even getting the kinds of services and supports that you need. Like if your clinics are being closed and your schools are being closed at the same time that your property tax value dollars are going up, this doesn't make sense. Um, and, you know, I think that this, the centering of uh, sort of corporate Chicago and downtown businesses really to the detriment of neighborhoods and communities is staggering. And I think that you, you can talk about grants to neighborhoods and all of that is good, but we need real structural change in the city of Chicago. And, and I think that's what's unfortunate with um, this, you know, city of Chicago fighting us on this lawsuit because there's this is the opportunity to make some structural change to the system that we desperately need. All right, now, Carlos, what role can the city council play in all this? In the past, uh, they were virtually they were the rubber stamp that approved whatever budget the mayor wanted. There would be a handful who would stand up and oppose them, yourself included. Uh, and uh, we have a new mayor. Uh, we have new aldermen. Lots of uh, progressive aldermen. Two will be at the hideout tonight uh, with me. Uh, what role can the city council play uh, in this coming budget uh, showdown that they haven't uh, played in the past? I think one of the most exciting developments is coming out of the group of aldermen that were elected with the support of United Working Families, or since being elected, have aligned themselves with United Working Families. So there's 10 aldermen, and we've committed to work with community groups, we've committed to work with uh, grassroots organizations, regular folks, to put forward a budget proposal to say, these are revenue ideas the city of Chicago should pursue, these are concepts that we should go down and fight for in Springfield, uh, and these are uh, priorities that we should invest in. So we're working hand-in-hand -hand with Grassroots Collaborative, we're working hand-in-hand -hand with United Working Families, and really the concept here is we're going to collectively bargain. 
So we're going to do something uh, that, you know, mayors in the city of Chicago have hated, uh, that employers hate. And I think we might have talked about this last time, right? But your employer wants you to go in and talk about your increase by yourself. They want to say, well, look, you know, Ben, you made this much last year and I really like your performance and we're yeah. going to give you a cost of living increase and your salary is going to go up 2.5%. Um, and they don't want you talking to your coworkers about what you're getting. And for a really long time, aldermen would essentially engage in the budget process in that way. So yeah. they'd go in and they meet with the mayor and they'd say, hey, Mr. Mayor, I need 10 new playgrounds in my ward. Hey, Mr. Mayor, you know, that 1.3 million, we get to fix streets in our district. It's really not enough. Can you do 10 more streets? Uh, can you commit to build a new school in my ward? And the mayor would horse trade and, you know, you wouldn't tell anyone, this is what I got, right? You'd, you'd have to hide. And, and then eventually the, you know, the headlines would come out three months later. Oh, this uh, project is being built in the ward. And people were like, oh, you got that? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Wheeling and dealing. Yeah. So, um, or, or you'd have some, you know, colleagues would be like, yeah, this is what I got, you know, and they're, yeah. um, is that your but, record, no cimentation? Just kidding. Oh, All right, go on. Uh, sorry. But, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, where, where, where we're at now is we understand that that is not an effective way. And, and it's a way, you know, it, it worked, you know, when the federal government was investing heavily in cities, uh, when you had, uh, you know, a tax uh, to GDP ratio that was a little bit uh, more sensical uh, and the city and uh, the federal government and the state had more revenue uh, to spend on that kind of largesse. Uh, but when we are facing an austerity budget, when we are facing real tough decisions that have to be made about who's going to continue to pay for our retiree benefits, who's going to pay to make sure that our roads are being fixed, that our children are being educated, uh, we really need to uh, engage in the work that legislators need to engage in, and that's caucusing together, talking about what our priorities are, not for just one block, but for the entire city of Chicago. Um, so United Working Families, we've committed to engage in that collective bargaining, uh, and we know that other aldermen are interested in joining us uh, and being part of that conversation. So we are increasingly seeing broader agreement in terms of moving forward on the corporate head tax, moving forward on you know ride share, uh, and also on another issue, pilot. So pilot. pilot it refers to payment in lieu of taxes. There are a ton of, uh, you know, uh, large institutions in the city mm. of Chicago, Rush, uh, the University of Chicago, and they have an extraordinary amount of wealth and they essentially function as a for-profit entity. Uh, and they have uh, executive leadership that are being compensated very, very handsomely. Um, yet what they will do, and, and this is very true in the context of the University of Chicago, is that they'll buy up all this land around them in Hyde Park and Woodlawn. They'll put one university office on the ground floor. They'll build 24 floors on top of that, and they'll rent that all out, and that all goes into their endowment. And so what then happens is, is that because they are a nonprofit, because they're not paying property tax, taxes on that property, the city of Chicago is losing out. So this was a major issue in, you can probably guess the city, Boston, because of the number of universities. I've visited Boston a couple of times. I'm like, this is a never ending college campus. Um, with like some lobster like thrown in between. But <laughs> <laughs> and clam chowder. Yeah. Um, and like some place where Joe Kennedy did something once. But um, I will say that, um, you know, I, I think that um, what we can do as a city is we can go and bargain collectively with these institutions and say, look, you know, you can either have a partner in the city of Chicago where we continue to talk about, uh, you know, the the a good working relationship, or uh, and 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 in return, give us a payment in lieu of taxes. Let's negotiate what that looks like. Um, otherwise, we're going to have to start, you know, looking at, you know, the impact that you're having on our neighborhoods, the impact you're having on our property tax base, and and really, you know, figuring out, uh, you know, where we go from there. All right. Uh, by the way, I, I'm not a complete expert in property tax law, but I do believe in just, I know you were just give, uh, giving an example. If, if a university builds a skyscraper uh, on top of a university uh, office, they have to pay property taxes on the non- university portion of that. We'll have our legion of lawyers, yes, property please. tax lawyers investigating. <laughs> your, your overall point's a good one, yeah. but I, I, I think in that one instance, I just wanted to correct that one. All right, let's move on uh, to the pending teacher strike uh, before Misha has to leave to go out for the rest of her day. Uh, this has been on my mind a lot, Amisha and Carlos. Um, I have the feeling that this could be a nasty strike. I have the feeling that we're settling in uh, for what could be, there's just like a lot of blad, bad blood here that's kind of under the surface, uh, if you will. And I just want to get your thoughts on how this would uh, play out. What's your sense, Amisha, what public attitudes in the city of Chicago are, for instance, to the teachers uh, and to the possible strike? 
Well, I think there still remains um, enormous public support for teachers, and that's been that was certainly true all through Rahm Emanuel, and I think that that is still true. Um, the role that the Chicago Teachers Union plays in the mind of parents and um, community members is overall very positive, and people see, um, you know, definitely saw it in Karen Lewis, and I th still see it in being people who are really fighting for public education in their neighborhoods. The things they're talking about are things that directly affect every student and, of course, the larger community as a whole, not having nurses and social workers and the kind of supports that students really need to succeed and to thrive. And the fundamental idea that every student should get to thrive is exactly what CT was fighting for. So, you know, I think that um, I think the mayor is uh, a likely banking on the public support that she has um, in the city to and and might think that she's can kind of can take on and handle a, a, a Chicago Teachers Union strike. Also, we have to talk about SEIU Local 73, um, who also took a strike authorization vote. And these are support staff in the schools and the park district members that they represent as oh. well. All over 90% support in each of these bargaining units of all members, not just like people who voted, but of all members have voted um, to strike. So there is a, there is something real, um, of course, that's that's brewing here. And this um, and, the, and I do think, again, this goes back to this question of whose city is this? And um, I think the CTU and SEIU 73 really sees that this is a the moment like if we don't fight for the kinds of supports and resources that both we need in our parks and in our schools, um, the city will continue to move away from the hands of working people. So um, I do think if the if the strike happens, it is going to. Um, I really hope that Lightfoot will not make it ugly, and I really hope that um, that really the. It sounds like there's actually real offers finally being presented um, at the bargaining table, which hadn't been true for months and months. Um, and whether they'll get to actually putting everything in writing, which has been the main demand. Um, you know, Lightfoot has promised all kinds of things, but I think the point that we've heard today is that Lightfoot promised that stuff certainly as candidate as a candidate Lightfoot and has not delivered as mayor and now as mayor is also promising things but I'm sorry we actually know in the city how things work and this is true everywhere we put it in writing mm -hmm. and it's a very basic thing like if that's if, if you are committed to say like all the things you're committed to put it in writing and I think in the absence of that we've got a real issue here because there is nothing how do you go on a verbal promise to say okay cool you've got us when that the track record isn't there to really show this stop the gaslighting put it in writing <laughs> you know i feel i feel I like love that i just like talked for like five minutes about all these things and then sense, carlos man. is like here's my bumper sticker that's pretty good did you just come up with that or did the teacher say that at the it was i, I thought about it this morning oh, um okay. so you know mayor lightfoot and, and her hand-picked board of ed they put out this website where they're like, we've committed to increase the number of nurses and librarians and social workers. And so that would make you think that at the bargaining table, they are committing to put in writing in contractually enforceable language that they are going to hire a certain number of social workers and nurses and librarians to a certain ratio in our schools, right? And meet one of the demands of the teachers. But then you scroll down on the website and it's like, so if you're good, committing to hire these people, why won't you put it in writing? And it's like, well, because it's complicated and you know, long story short, we're not gonna put it in writing. So that's gaslighting, right? I feel like <laughs> the entire city of Chicago is just constantly being gaslit. Um, and and for those of you not to, I'm a young person, it's yeah. a little bit wild <laughs> to really understand what gaslighting was. But I would love to hear the millennial explanation Yeah, so this is my explanation. This is my, right, this is, so you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a husband and wife, right? And, uh, you know, the husband uh, says, honey, I'm going to go pick up the kids after school. Right. Uh -huh. And then uh, they both get home and neither of them have the kids. And the husband says, honey, you said you were going to pick up the kids. Yeah, right. And she's like, no, right. she's like, you. and he's just lying. And he's going on and on and is adamant that she said he was going to pick up that she was going to pick up the kids when really it was him all along. Or another example, uh, he didn't pick up the kids, but he's just like, no, I picked them up. You know, but he just didn't pick them up. Yeah. Right. So that's an example of gaslighting. And I feel like, you know, telling the city of Chicago, I've committed to hire nurses, librarians, but refusing to put it in writing that you're driving us all mad. That's gaslighting. All so right. stop the gaslighting, put it in writing. All right. Very good. And as Misha Patel can tell you, because one of her favorite movies is Gaslight, literally what happens in the movie Gaslight is that a husband turns down the lights and and tells 
the wife's like, it's dark in the house. He goes, no, it's not, honey. It's not dark in the house. Good movie, by the way, Gaslight. I didn't even know that that was the movie, but. Yeah, well, I mean, that's there you go. an old guy there and you a young go. guy. But Misha loves that This movie. is what is happening in the city of Chicago at this moment. That's what gaslighting is. All right, now, uh, the reality is that teachers cannot go on strike by state law for what you're talking about, for uh, trying to uh, put in writing uh, an obligation to hire more nurses or social workers or librarians, good God, librarians, you know, uh, and uh, they can't, they cannot go, they can only go strike uh, for pay issues. And that kind of puts the teachers union in a box a little bit, Carlos. But this is the silly notion about that. So a lot of teachers that I speak to, they say, well, first of all, you know, there's this 16% raise and you look at them, and you're like, oh my God. But then when you look at the fact that it's over five years, that's a cost of living increase. Right. And what that means is that's simply designed there so that you don't fall behind so that your quality of life, your ability to purchase things, whether that be milk, whether that be pay your rent, your mortgage does not diminish. Right. So that's just really keeping you up to where you're at right now. So really, the only offer that the mayor has put on the table when it comes to compensation is a cost of living increase. Now, imagine if you're a teacher right, who has to deal with all the issues that really a nurse should be dealing with, that a social worker should be dealing with. If you're the one that has to be the librarian, right, and you're dealing with all that work, and the only thing you're being offered is a cost of living increase, and you're saying, what the hell? You know, I'm already doing all this work. Mm -hmm. You're not willing to bring in people to really provide the services and support that my students need. And all you want to tell me is that I'm going to keep making the same pay over the next five years. So teachers are saying, really, it's not enough. They, many teachers have told me they would forego that pay increase in order to see, uh, first of all, it's not a pay increase, they would forego that, that cost of living increase in order to see the support staff. But the other thing too is that there are many paraprofessional workers in the schools that kids, they qualify for free lunch because that's the level of income that they're making. And there's a lot of school uh, secretaries that are right now doing the job of a nurse and handing out medication to kids throughout the day. Right, that that kid needs to be taking. So both the teachers and the prayer professionals understand the centrality of putting contractually enforceable agreements that you're going to hire these folks, uh, and that is totally tied into teacher compensation. Dude, you should be a lawyer. That was very well done because that's a way the teachers can make the uh, the teachers union can make the argument uh, that really when they ask for nurses to be uh, contractually. Uh, protected in, in, and will be hired as opposed to just putting a promise, as which Amisha was talking about, uh, then they they can make that argument that you made without being thrown into jail. We'll see uh, if it But is Lori out. gonna throw them in jail? Do you think she's gonna do that? I don't know, what do you think, Amisha? I think that um, I am worried that the mayor is trying to say that this is an illegal strike. And that was gonna be, that will be her line. Like, look at all the things, look at the pay, you know, again, we'll look at the website they're making of all the things, here's what we're offering. And to really try to kind of tap into a narrative around a greedy teacher, teacher or greedy teachers union. Um, and I think that the challenge here is to really, um, as Carlos said, like this is like, what the teachers are clear about is this fight is much bigger and it is the fight of really again of like the core values of our city um and that's going to go against her narrative that this is they don't but, have the but right this is to the do thing. this look people are like well look at the polling what does the public say if you poll and you ask people right now well who do you think is on the right you know is it the teachers as this like abstract concept of a teacher mm -hmm. or is it you know and, the, and their union or is it the mayor and you're going to get you know people answering that question different ways the moment that a teacher goes out on strike, who you see out there is your neighbor. When you have 25,000 teachers, that's 25,000 neighbors. That's 25,000 co-parents that are taking care of your kid who you respect and who you fundamentally on a very human level support and care for. That is also someone uh, that is your cousin, right? That is your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law. So I don't care what any polling or what any expert says, the moment that those teachers go on strike, ultimately, I believe public sentiment will be on their side. And and shame on Mayor Lightfoot if she sends police officers out there to arrest those yeah. teachers because then what you're gonna have is the image of your neighbor, of your teacher, of that educator, of that leader in your community being uh, you know locked up in chains because they're fighting to get a nurse and well, I don't for think school. Uh, they would lock up a teacher. Big PR lose. They, yeah, they Loser. Would, yeah, I yeah. mean, if uh, if anything, it would be the leader of the union that would, if, if it came to this, if, if, if it came to this, it would be the leader of the union wouldn't lock up individual teachers. Well, I think the other thing we have to understand that the other thing that will be happening, um, at, um, at this time is 
Lori's budget address, where the reality of what she's actually saying is going to be the fix um, for this budget is going to be coming out. So I think that all kinds of stuff is in flux. And if the mayor thinks that she could, you know, she's got public opinion on her side, it is, we all know another mayor who also thought that as well. And it was a grave misstep because yeah. um, the people are with their teachers, they're with our schools, and they're with people who are fighting for their, fighting for nurses, librarians, um, teaching assistants, all of that. Like that is who people are with. All right, uh, that's Amisha Patel, Carlos Ramirez Rosa in the studio as, uh, as well. Amisha told me she had to get somewhere 240. I, I see she's late. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hold her off. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, uh, Carlos and I will take the deep dive in all the national news. He a Bernie supporter, so I'll put on my Elizabeth Warren hat and we'll duel it out. How about that? Cool. Uh, although I have actually not really supporting was kind of a Bernie supporter myself, but I just want to make something like a, a, a I love here. Elizabeth Warren. I love her. All right. Amisha Patel, thank you so much for coming in. We'll be right back after this. If the mayor has baked this into the budget, then it should be very easy then to put it in writing, right? It's already there. And so that's the dilemma that she has before her. Our members have spoken. The city of Chicago has spoken. Our fight is not a new fight. We have had the same line in years the chickens have come home to roost put it in writing attention chicago innovators and creators 2019 chicago ideas week is coming soon october 12th through the 17th, this annual Ideas Festival is back, and it's the largest, most affordable Ideas Festival of its kind. They bring in hundreds of thought leaders from around the globe and some local to share ideas and spark action all across Chicago. To get a better idea of what to expect, here's a bit of audio from last year's Chicago Ideas Week with special guest and Chicago comedian Cameron Esposito. Everything that I have ever tried to do has had two motivations. One is I really do believe in trying to create social change, and then the other one is I'm scared and alone too, so I would like for you to join me. You know, every job that I have, I try to make sure to hold the door open. That's like my uh, motto for, for um, like if I get through, you're coming with me. And I really, I believe in that wholeheartedly. And uh, especially if I have more privilege than you, like I'm holding the door open for you um, even wider. October 12th through the 17th, it's 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. Tickets go on sale to members on August 22nd and to general public September 10th. Once again, if you're an innovator or creator in the city of Chicago or even outside the city, you must join us for Chicago Ideas Week, October 12th through the 17th. For tickets and event information, head to chicagoideas.com. That's chicagoideas.com. And we hope to see you October 12th through the 17th for 2019 Chicago Ideas Week. This is an awfully big body of water. We're looking for a needle in a haystack. And we're talking about a needle that moves constantly. He's checked the floating traps he hand curated. Right now is a combination of drumsticks, rats, and uh, smelt. Yum. Well, as far as the gator goes, that's a pretty good offering. We're hoping that the, the wind blowing the scent across the water will catch his attention. We're all speculating on, on whether he grew up in somebody's you know, bathtub or backyard or something. He's enjoying the, the five feet of water. He probably was raised in six inches. If we could find the animal, we can capture the animal. Thank you, Gator Bob. Hey, podcast fans, that's you listening to the show right now. The team at the Chicago Sun-Times have a new show to add to your listening lineup, especially if you like football. This football season, get the inside scoop on the Chicago Bears with Hallis. Intrigue. It's the latest podcast from the Chicago Sun Times. Tune in to hear Sun Times sports reporters and so many Bears experts. Your head may explode. Uh, it's a fantastic time. You can stay informed this football season. Listen to Hallis Intrigue at suntimes.com forward slash Hallis. That's suntimes.com forward slash H A L A. S and be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Check it out now, suntimes.com forward slash Hallis. Now back to the Ben Jarofsky show. 
Live from the Chicago Sun Times. 35th Ward, Alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa is still in the studio. Misha had that I am. Uh, and uh, I said I was going to sh- uh, switch things to national politics, but I just want to ask one final question about a pending teacher strike. What role can the alderman play? And I, I this occurred to me as uh, we were going to break. The, the last major teacher strike was 2012 before you were an alderman. Uh, and I believe back then there were like four aldermen who stood with the teachers. Uh, Nick Spazzato, say what you will about Nick, he was there. Uh, and God bless him for that. Uh, Bob Fioretti, who was <laughs> lost his seat, uh, he was there. They redistricted him out. Uh, Scotty Wagasback was with them as well. And I think Arena might have been on stage with them as well. So not a lot. Yeah. Most of them were with the mayor. What do you think the role? Well, I understand it was very common for teachers to regularly go out on strike. And we had not had a teacher strike for a decade or, or oh, more. 20, over 20 yeah. years. And so, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of aldermen, one, they're just, their values were out of whack, right? Because it's like, you stand with workers, right? I don't care what it is when those workers, when they engage in that collective bargaining action, when they come together, you stand with them no matter what. That's my, you know, North Star. Um, so shame on you, Miguel de Valle. No, I'm going to get up there. Half <laughs> <close>. um, <laughs> he was actually never an alderman, but whatever. No, 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 no. Did you read his, uh, his editorial? Yes, I did. And it's, I'm like, yes, that, that is, that is, that is yes. akin to crossing a picket line because you are actively seeking to diminish the ability of these workers, uh, and this union, you know, to win their demands. Um, but let me point out that Miguel de Valle that, uh, Carlos was alluding to former state Senator Miguel de Valle is now a hero of mine. That's uh, what, that's why I'm angry. I feel yeah. Betrayed. And and he's the uh, head of the, the the board of education appointed by Mayor Lightfoot. And that would be an argument, I'd say, for an elected school board. But continue with uh, what you were saying. So, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of aldermen just didn't have a sense of, you know, and, and they're getting told these, uh, they're being fed this this line by the, by the papers, by the consensus at City Hall, which is like, oh, just everyone's going to turn against the teachers because the parents are going to be super upset that they got to find, you know, child care uh, while the teachers are out on strike and people are going to say, look at how greedy they are. You know, I haven't gotten a cost of living increase and, um, you know, ultimately that they were wrong. And, and I think that a lot of aldermen now understand that. And that's why, uh, alongside just the amazing work that CTU and uh, CORE has been doing at really reaching out to aldermen, organizing on the ground, making deep connections with neighborhood groups and really understanding uh, you know, how it is that, that you move entire communities to understand what it is that you're fighting for. Um, we just saw the Latino caucus vote unanimously to support the Chicago Teachers Union in their fight and in their, uh, you know, contract demands and uh, to pass a uh, and to immediately issue a statement of support should the teachers go out on strike. So, you know, I, I think that wow, that's a, that is, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> it's a new, Danny Solis is not in that group anymore. No, it, I mean, it, and, is, uh, it is a huge change. Coco Joe's not in the building anymore. I remember a few years ago yeah. uh, when, you know, there, there were similar tension between, you know, uh, then Forrest Claypool uh, at the, uh, you know, uh, CPS and uh, the teachers, you know, yeah, we, we brought Forrest Claypool into the Latino caucus meeting. And, you know, there was just all these colleagues of mine in the caucus just trashing the teachers and saying, they're ridiculous. Uh-huh. And what they're asking for is totally out of line. And so I think that I think that people really get it now that our teachers know best what's good for our kids, mm-hmm. right? They're in there every single day. They're there when there's a shooting at the school, right? They're there when, you know, the kid is dealing with, uh, you know, domestic violence at home. They're there when, you know, our kids are dealing with, uh, you know, the trauma uh, and, uh, you know, nerve wracking reality of uh, high, you know, uh, stakes testing. So I, I think people increasingly understand that, you know, um, you really need to empower teachers to be making the dis- educational policy decisions that impact our kids and that we're all gonna be better off for it. Actually, you know, Finland has one of the best school systems in the world and really it's all teacher run it's all teacher led um and you know each school essentially the teachers are the ones that are setting the curriculum that are setting the policy that are determining how much prep time they have that are determining what time of test prep they do uh it, it's not this very you know um authoritarian manner of approaching education which is just totally uh you know uh so clear to see in the way that you know cps uh you know just constantly wants to empower 
principals, many of who have no background or experience in the classroom, you know, but did an MBA program, uh, you know, and have them make the decisions. And really, they're just looking at it as, you know, um, widgets mm -hmm. and, you know, little numbers on a spreadsheet. And, you know, how do we, you know, get teachers to work longer hours? And, you know, how do we improve this test score? But not really looking at the, the school as a community uh, and as, you know, a, a holistic institution where a student is receiving love, where they're receiving support, where they're receiving the type of uh, services that they need. All right. And in addition to uh, the Latino Caucus, I did not know that, that they had made that vote. Thank you for telling me that. What about the Progressive Caucus? Have they they uh, weighed in on this. So uh, we have not uh, met since, uh, you know, things have started to, to heat up and, and uh, we have not met certainly since, uh, you know, the, the CTU uh, finished their strike vote. But, you know, I have spoken uh, with the chairwoman of the Progressive Caucus, Sue Garza, and I, I expect that uh, <laughs> they, we will have a Sue, similar position. Sue Garza made, uh, let's, all right, let, that gives a perfect opportunity to shift gears. Sue Garza and you were at the Bernie rally, but that was at the Chicago Teachers Union uh, headquarters. The last, I think it was last Tuesday, I want to say. Uh, oh, yeah. Wednesday, whenever it was. I've lost track of time, Carlos. Uh, and uh, weren't you the one? Wait, who introduced Bernie? Did you get to introduce Bernie? I can't remember. So I was the master of ceremony. I see. Uh, and then uh, Sue introduced Bernie. So, Sue introduced Bernie. All right. So what what do you expect national politics? I mean, this gets at the heart of what the Democrats are supposed to represent, right? Working people, teachers rising up to demand uh, funding for our schools. It seems like the Democrats as a whole, nationwide, are heading in that direction. Now we're here in the city of Chicago, a democratic run city, and we're mired in a teacher strike. It doesn't look good. The optics, as they say, the PR game are not good for the That's democratic right. party. Well, I mean, I think one, you saw uh, Bernie uh, come out and say unequivocally, I support the teachers. I support, you know, the workers with SEIU Local 73 who work in our park districts, who uh, work as security guards in our schools. Uh, and then similar to what we've seen consistently over the last, you know, two years as every other Democrat in the field then, you know, tries to catch up with Bernie. Um, <laughs> similar, you know, comes out for Medicare for all. And then suddenly everyone's like, I'm for Medicare for all with an asterisk. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, the uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren came out and, and said unequivocally that she supports the teachers. Uh, Joe Biden came out and said he supports the teachers. Joaquin Castro came out and said that he supports the teachers. And then Kamala Harris came out and says that she supports the teacher. But you now have the three Democratic front runners, uh, plus all three candidates that I like. I, I like Bernie. Uh, Elizabeth Warren and Joaquin Castro actually in that order. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, they, they came out and, uh, you know, all uh, said that they stand unequivocally with the teachers. And so I, I think that shows kind of that um, discrepancy that you were talking about, right? Is that nationally, Democrats really understand that the push for, you know, charter schools, for school privatization, the attack on teachers as somehow uh, the folks that we are to blame for, you know, our underfunded public education system, uh, for the lack of, you know, uh, support that families and students receive outside of the classroom. Let's just blame it all on the teachers as if suddenly, you know, a teacher and their salary was supposed to be able to address all of the poverty that a student faced in their community, um, all of the generational trauma and issues that they faced in their community, which was totally ludicrous. But I'm referring to the, you know, waiting for Superman era. Yeah. Uh, you know, where Oprah Winfrey is like, you know, talking to these like charter school privatizer people and they're like, yeah, it's those teachers and they're just greedy and they're horrible and we should blame them for everything in our society. Um, so it's a, it's a far cry from, you know, that time that we were in. And props to CTU because, you know, when Karen Lewis uh, and CORE, you know, uh, took over that union with a rank and file, you know, takeover and said, we really need a fighting militant union that is run by the teachers and its members. That was at the height of the Waiting for Superman era. And uh, they were unapologetic. Uh, and they fought uh, for our students and they fought for good contracts. And uh, that really helped spark an entire movement uh, across the U.S., which we saw most recently as the Red for Ed movement, where teachers who didn't even have the ability to unionize were going out on strike. Uh, since the last time you were in the studio, Whistleblower Gate has erupted. He's confessed it, was on the phone with the president of Ukraine, uh, trying to get that president to dig up dirt on Joe Biden. In exchange, Donald Trump would release uh, $395 million or so in uh, military aid to Ukraine. Uh, look pretty much like a mobster <laughs> move of extortion to me. I still don't know why Rod Blagojevich is still in prison uh, and Donald Trump gets to be the president of the United States. Uh, but it's completely overwhelmed at the moment, uh, our, the presidential nomination. Uh, what's your general thoughts, uh, Carlos, when you see this? Do you think this is helpful to the Democrats? Uh, or do you think th do they have absolutely no choice but to go after uh, Donald Trump because he's 
collect sticking the middle finger at yeah. them every day. Well, and then there's also, uh, you know, the most recent news that involves uh, the Australian prime minister. That's correct. Uh, and, mm-hmm. you know, the, the request that uh, <laughs> President Trump was making of him as it regards to the Mueller report. I think that it's extremely important for Democrats, um, yes, to move forward with uh, this impeachment. But I also think it's extremely important that we not lose sight that ultimately we have to defeat Trump and Trumpism on the issues, that we have to win the battle of hearts and minds. Because, okay, if if you win on a procedural matter uh, in politics, that's in many ways a fearic victory. Right. Because if 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 we succeed in impeaching Trump and removing him from office, we still have Pence. Right. Who is equally as bad when it comes to the policy. Um, And uh, and in reality, um, you know, if if we don't win the hearts and minds of the American public and show them that that fascism, that this, uh, you know, this lurch towards authoritarianism, uh, that this system that, you know, rigs this economy in favor of the rich and powerful, uh, that allows us to march off the climate change cliff. Uh, if we don't win that battle, then ultimately we've lost. And I, and I think that some Democrats, uh, like Alexandria Castro Cortez, understands that very clearly, right? She's like, I'm with one fist, she's punching and saying impeachment. With the other fist, she's punching and saying, you know, we need bold policy to address climate change. We need to stand with workers. Other Democrats uh, don't quite get that. Um, and, and I think that as a party, we need to do a better job of understanding that, um, you know, we can't repeat the mistake of the 2016 election right, where we came at Trump for his incivility, where we came at Trump, you know, for his personal failings, but did not talk about how the policy solutions that he was prescribing for America were snakeskin oil. Well, I, I, to this point, and I, I think every time you come on the show, I remind folks that you were on stage at the hideout in 2016. Keep David, reminding them. Yeah, poor David Moore, <laughs> and I, I, he did the best he could, was, defend, was Hillary's, uh, stand in and you were Bernie stand in and the issue came up for many of the older people in the audience of my generation were questioning you there's no way a Bernie could win in a general election fast forward there was just this article in the Tribune I don't know if you saw it I talked about it earlier uh, or I talked about it last week UAW striking UAW workers the UAW is on strike against General Motors uh, striking UAW workers on the line saying they support Donald Trump even though Donald Trump oh. has done absolutely Nothing, absolutely nothing for them, their union, their strike, anything. They just, they like his style, all right? Uh, the, the person that they said on the Democratic side uh, that they most respected was Bernie Sanders. And Carlos, I'm reading this, there's so much about this that's irrational, starting with the fact a striking auto worker would defend, want Donald Trump as his president. The, but the notion that, he would have admiration for two uh, politicians who are diametrically opposed in every single way when it comes to their ideo- ideology and their worldview, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. There's something going on here that's outside the realm of normal politics. You don't win elections by yelling at people and telling them that they're sexist or that they're racist. Um, you win elections by putting forward to people a plan that is going to address uh, the issues that are causing concern in their lives. And uh, I, I think that, you know, what I saw in the 2016 election was, again, it was, it was just this, you know, notion of, uh, you know, Donald Trump makes fun of people with disabilities. That is horrible. That is horrendous. And that's not right. Um, but if, if that's the only reason that you're giving to vote for your candidate, right, is that Donald Trump says bad things. And here's Donald Trump saying, I'm going to make America great again. I'm going to address the economic inequality that you're facing. I'm going to bring back jobs to your, you know, small town. I'm going to reinvigorate your main street. What's the rational choice there, right? Vote against this guy because he says mean things or vote for this guy because he's going to make America. So the reality is, is that, you know, I think that, that, Bernie is very consistent about focusing on the issues and constantly when he talks about why should you vote for me it's because of his big, bold, progressive plans that are going to bring back the union movement, that are going to bring back good jobs, that are going to make sure uh, that we, uh, you know, have health care as a human right, that we have housing as a human right, that we have public education from cradle to grave as a human right. So, uh, you know, those are things that are wildly, extremely popular. And I just find it so just upsetting that you have all these quote unquote moderate Democrats, which really I'm just going to call them what it is. They're corporate Democrats saying, oh, no, those are losing propositions. And instead, what we need to do is we need to yell at a bunch of people that, you know, they're sexist for, you know, supporting an old white man, quote unquote, 
you know, and it's like, um, no, they support, you know, Bernie because they like Medicare for all. They yeah. support Bernie because they want free college tuition. They support Bernie because they believe that he is authentic and that he's going to do what he says that he's going to do because that's what he said his entire political career. So, uh, again, my my, you know, uh, call on my fellow Democrats would be we got to win on the issues and we really got to talk to people about, you know, uh, what it is that they're facing in their communities around housing, around health care, uh, around workers' rights, around compensation, uh, and what's our plan to address those things. And this is really being drowned out right now by impeachment. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I mean, there's nothing you could do about it, Carl. You know what I'm saying, Carl? There's yeah. just absolutely well, nothing I, you can do. I will do say I no longer watch the, the quote-unquote <laughs> network news, um, but one of the funniest things, because I, I, I'm on Twitter a lot, one of the funniest things is, uh, you know, kind of just seeing how, uh, you know, Fox News is just like, it's like, there's just it's madness right now. They're all tripping over themselves. They can't figure out what their line is. So, I mean, that is entertaining. Um, and, and like I said, you know, to, to the extent that, you know, Donald Trump, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, used the most powerful position in the globe, uh, you know, to to go after political enemies. Uh, I, I think that, you know, that that warrants, uh, you know, the, the impeachment that's moving forward right now. But we cannot lose sight of those bread and butter issues that are ultimately what's going to defeat Trump and Trumpism. Uh, if Trump isn't uh, a Trumpism, and that would be Mike yeah. uh, Pence. I do not believe, by the way, I do not believe that Trump will be impeached. I do not believe the votes. We had a, uh, uh, a guest on the studio last week who said that if if Mitch McConnell comes to the decision that it's he's going to lose the Senate uh, over Donald Trump he will sacrifice Donald Trump. I I understand why she said that. I don't believe that will happen. So I believe Donald Trump will not be impeached. And ultimately, if they even call a vote in the Senate at all, and there's some question as to whether Mitch McConnell will do that, yeah. uh, he will be uh, uh, acquitted by the Senate. It's also just funny, like, watching uh, Mitch McConnell and all his quotes from the Clinton impeachment yeah. and now applying them today. It's just... It, it, I think it really shows, you know, how politics can be so cynical and self-serving. And and I think that's why ultimately, you know, we got to take a step back from the theater and really focus on the bread and butter issues. Because, um, you know, I think that it was a lot of the bread and butter issues and the inability of Democrats to put forward a clear, concise plan that people understood about those bread and butter issues in 2016 that got us Donald Trump. I mean, if you look at it, was there six million voters that crossed over from Obama to Trump? Yes, it was. Between surreal. 12. Right. And, and then you can't call those people racist. They voted to have the first black president in the history of the United States. They did not have an issue with the color of Barack Obama's skin or who his parents were. They voted to elect Barack Obama and then they crossed over and voted for Trump. And of course, you know, there's a lot to be said about the the inability of the, of the Hillary campaign to well, not inability, but choice to not do outreach in mm -hmm. certain key states. Um, I'm for Bernie Sanders because Bernie has the most diverse base. He has the largest working class base. If you look at the employer of the largest group of people who are donating to him, it's Walmart workers. So think about that. Some of the most exploited, most impoverished workers in this nation are taking their precious dollars and donating month after month to Bernie Sanders. And that's why he just had the largest haul of any Democrat in this uh, primary race, $25 million in the past quarter. All right, Carlos, before we head out the door, I'm going to throw a curveball at you. This is on my mind. I didn't even tell you I was going to tell you this, so let's get your reaction. Bill Maher, who has, uh, uh, you know, you know Bill Maher is, has a show on TV, did a long interview with the New York Times yesterday. He's like a sexist on TV, right? Oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> here we go. I can see the answer coming already. Uh, and uh, it was an interesting interview. It was in the New York Times. Uh, it just broke yesterday. That's where I saw it anyway. Um, and in that he waged war, a war of words, a metaphorical war, uh, against what he called the cultural political correctness and said that political correctness had become a confining force in American culture, uh, in American universities, on TV shows like his own, uh, that kept people from really speaking the truth because they're always afraid of saying the wrong thing that would get them accused uh, and uh, of of being what racist sexist etc and so forth uh this has been on my mind but thinking about what he had to say i have my thoughts on it but i would really just love to get your thoughts on this subject uh what's your thoughts about this I mean, what, what does he mean by political correctness I, I think first we would need to define that word uh to get a sense of what exactly it is that we're talking about um should we uh denounce people that say racist things absolutely we have 
a racist in the White House who has put forward white supremacist rhetoric. And as a result, we have seen a sizable increase in the number of hate crimes against the Jewish people, against Mexican people, against black people. Um, you know, words matter. Um, and, and so, you know, this notion, if, if what Bill Maher is saying is that we shouldn't call out racism and sexism and xenophobia, that is just totally wrong. And, and Bill Maher is not paying attention to history. Because the reality is, is that when you see that lurch towards xenophobia, when you see that lurch towards fascism and a system that is predicated upon dividing people and jailing people and oppressing people, uh, we have to call it out. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, at the same time though, and, and I, I kind of said this earlier is, you know, you don't win elections by yelling at people and telling them they're, se they're sexist or racist, yeah. right? Um, and, and so I, I think um, it, it requires us as Democrats to understand that um, we as a party are stronger when we speak to the bread and butter issues that Democrats have always won elections on. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, we this is a time that we need an FDR style candidate, someone that is really going to come in with bold plans that are going to transform this country and the globe, and we really need it because we are staring down a mass extinction. We're in the first stages of that. And uh, there's no denying that climate change is real. There's no denying uh, that, you know, we as a globe need to really come together and figure out what the future looks like. Um, and, and right now, the, the future that Trump and Trumpism is laying out for us, or that the Bolsonaros of Brazil are laying out for us, uh, is uh, extremely scary and frightening because it means people in cages, uh, it means a, a world where we continue to kill our planet so that a few selected, uh, you know, oligarchs can make an incredible amount of profit. All right. Very good. I think we'll uh, end it there. Uh, Carlos Ramirez Rosa, the Alderman of the 35th Ward. Thank you very much. Also want to thank Amisha Patel. Amaya Dukmasova was our guest earlier in the day. Uh, I... Dukmasova. Dukmasova. What did I say? Dukmasova. Oh, Dukmasova. There you go. Uh, and I'll be at the hideout later tonight with Alderwoman Jeanette Taylor. Uh, a powerhouse, Carlos. Oh, uh, my God, I love her. I love her. <laughs> she is awesome. And Alderman Matt Martin, the newly elected Alderman of the 47th. Who's also awesome. Yeah, he's, uh, and we'll be talking. That's a great panel. It is a great panel. We'll be Wait. talking a lot, a lot of the same things. I can things. retire now. Yeah. <laughs> you're only, you're not even, are you Wait, 30 we got, yet? We got Matt, I am 30. <laughs> oh, we got God. Matt Martin and we got uh, Jeanette Taylor. Jeanette so Taylor. Good hands. Yeah, good hands. Matt Martin and Jeanette Taylor. Uh, and should be a lot of fun to be talking politics. Uh, 6.30 tonight, 1354. Six, as in Bill Maher would say, go people, come on people, okay, <laughs> Bill people. Maher. Come Bill on, Maher people. took it to an extreme, but he's entertaining, but he took it to an extreme in that interview. Anyway, I want to thank all my great guests, and I'll see everybody at the hideout, and of course the man, the myth, the legend over there, the pride and joy of Alton, Illinois, went to Southwestern High School down there where they called him White Lightning. Yeah, that was his nickname back in the day. Nope. <laughs> Give yourself a raise, Dennis. take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody. Hey, and remember, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows and Benny J bonus interviews at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites and wherever else you download your favorite podcasts. Hey, downloaders, you know we live stream this show, right? It's true. Tuesday through, Tuesdays through Fridays, I can talk. 1 until 3 p.m. Central Time at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites, the Chicago Sun-Times YouTube channel, and we are now live streaming on Facebook at Benny J Show. B-E-N-N-Y, the letter J Show. Tell your friends. And hey, tonight, 6.30, 13.54, West Wabonzia. It's the hideout. If you can't make it to the show tonight, do not worry. Also on the Facebook page, we're going to be live streaming the first Tuesday show as well.